massive victory in the second game and the series. It seemed like the casters had gone to Hogwarts because every single time they were casting and made predictions, they just put a caster curse down on poor big bongo boys. The is taken by... And that was Risen Hey everybody and welcome back to the Risen Recap. Today we're looking towards Prison Unstoppable and the stream started off with a bang, quicksand, and sleep. It's the first game of Unstoppable Prison Freeway! But now we're actually here to scream once you rolled into it. And our first series was Big Bongo Boys playing up against Clarity Black for the first 20 minutes of the game. There's a bit of fighting in the top lane, but not much happened besides that. boys after they made a big dragon attempt but then they got challenged again for the dragon attempt which big bongo big bongo boys won the fight towards on this side and there's a three on the other side but they can't punch it and i can't punch it but watch the unable to get too much out but fight the two before he's the last dies and she can try right to put a seat does not have force they have a million of them up they fill up they come from back in the circuit for fights but did she find you no she gets shut down and the exchange of lives is so insane can Maokai find the damage much later in the game, Big Bongo Boys chased Akali down in the ball lane, meaning that Clarity Black had so much freedom to take that first Baron, and from that Baron they spiraled away from the team fight and took the victory. The higher rank Clarity Black and The end, CLB. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Ryzen Unstoppable Pre Made League. And today, I'm going to be your host and play by pass play by play caster because, unfortunately, much like Quicksand, Quicksand's internet cable did go asleep. So, we got our my, I'm cool. play by play caster, and we got Mousetrap. <laughs> Telecaster, <laughs> introduce yourself. How are you doing today, man? I am doing good. I uh, am sad Quicksand's not here to join us today. Unfortunately, his internet has gone out. That is very sad. I don't know what's happening in the land down under right now, but um, scary stuff. But hopefully he can join us again next week. I am excited to hop into another week of League of Legends. Um, we are just having a, a little bit uh, delay of a draft, but we should be getting into it really soon. I'm really excited. How are you today, Slidey? No one ever asks you that. I'm doing fan freaking tastic. How a great day today. Being in college has been uh, quite the uh, humbling and self finding experience that I've had. Played a lot of Omega Strikes today. It's kind of like uh, League mixed with Smash, mixed with mixed with Rocket League. Uh, the Omega game Strikers. Made it. You should definitely check it out. It's actually a really fun game. Uh, wow. no, no product placement, no ad. Just shout out. <laughs> we're, we're not Just sponsored, are we? Go, yeah, yeah, not sponsored. <laughs> but make sure you go check that game out after uh, this. Yes. Risen games because there's going to be some exciting action here for you today. We got USF White versus Ascendant Five as we look to get into the draft that started out in the Vagar first band up for the side of A5. So, uh, looks like that it's definitely has to be some sort of comfort pick if we do look at the roster of uh, US, USF White. I really need to like memorize the teams beforehand, but USF White, um, just looking to ban out some comforts. That's really uh, important at this level of play. They will respond with an Udyr, so more of a meta ban there, actually. Uh huh. Yeah, Udyr recently worked a very interesting champion, to say the least. Uh, it's kind of hard to follow what he does sometimes, but overall, very a tanky, strong champion. And I'm not entirely sure where his win rate's at, but it has to be something at least decently well for a new <laughs> rework champion. And yes, that Vagar is indeed a comfort pick for Cheese, who is the mid laner for Team USF White. 
uh, almost 90 or 99 games, almost 100 on the champion so far this season, posting up a 59% win rate. So pretty impressive. Definitely looking to get that off the board. He is not allowed to play that this time around. Mm -hmm. There's a list of bands to fly out. We have a Vagar, a Gangplank, and a Zillion. Zillion, very effective. You've seen him a lot in pro play, especially in clutch situations, but bringing it out and potentially scared of it in game one. Do not want to let the revive come out. And that is kind of a telltale sign that you don't want the enemy team playing a late game sort of comp as the Hecarim is locked in. Just like last week, we see the Hecarim yet again. His nerves aren't coming in until the next patch. So he is still as dominant as ever. Uh... We'll see if uh, Ascendant 5 are able to use the power of that Hecarim effectively. And uh, we are they responded by a Tristana Amumu. So looking for a very aggressive bot lane on the other side. Yep, Tristana Amumu. A very good pairing. Not a known to, like not a very known pairing, I would say. But definitely very effective when you have the double bandage tossed and the Tristana rocket jump. You are able to easily and effectively get onto the enemy carries and snowball these leads early into potential late game power and ascendant five is able to pick what they want into that bot lane and it looks like they want to respond with a misfortune so a bit curious you know especially immobile ad carries are pretty uh are not not weak but it can be very dangerous going into a tristana is a very immobile bot lane but it looks like that's what they are responding with with the wombo combo of the seraphine misfortune yeah, interestingly, we saw this last time. We had a series here on this channel. Uh, they do have to go for Misfortune Seraphine. A very effective combo, as we said. Encore plus bullet time is insanely effective. But I do quite agree with you that against Tristana and Mumu, it can get a little bit dicey, especially in those early levels. And for USF White, it is dive, dive, dive. Lissandra is picked out to round out the first part of the draft. That is just a, we are going in, selecting one person, and just unplugging their keyboard. And that is not going to be fun. We They're not going to, gonna, yeah, they can't play the game. Yeah, and uh, ban's thrown out. They want the Skarner ban. Um, I like the idea. I like the I like the concept. They don't want them to have any more lockdown, which they already have so massive amounts of it with the Amumu ulti and stuff like the Lissandra. She has the Frozen Tomb. She has the mm -hmm. W. Uh, she even has a slow and a Q. It's it gets cr quite ridiculous, as you said. They don't get to play the game for a little bit, so they want to make it so they can't play even. They can even log into the game. They want to be able to even yeah. log into the game, so they want uh, to ban out the Skarner. I'm actually not a, a big fan of the Skarner ban because you know too much lockdown is just uh, just not really that worth it. So I don't think they would have been going for any more lockdown. So. I'm not a huge fan of the Skarner fan, but that is interesting. However, we do get a spicy pick at the Ivern, which is one of the first times I've ever seen this champion in competitive play. So this will be interesting. Yeah, most definitely. Ivern clearly showing that they want to play a hyper carry style. They have a supportive mid laner, a supportive jungler. And, you know, they obviously have a sport because that's on every team. And so they're really kind of playing around this Tristana to start out with, which is a very interesting idea. Let's see how they round out the comp. They might go for an aggressive top laner to also balance out damage numbers, but we see the Sajani thrown out on the side of NSN5, and a Victor picked up. How do you feel about this pick, going for another immobile carry? I know, I'm just not a huge fan of it. Like, if you look at their comp, there's so many uh, so many champions that Amumu, Lissandra, Ivern's not really a, a dive champion, but Daisy could go in. Rengar, another dive there. So, like, just so many champions on the side of Ascendant 5 that just can easily get picked off by this comp that USF White has selected. So, I'm not a huge fan of the Victor pickup, but uh, we'll see if they can provide the correct peel through the Sejuani, uh, Seraphine, and Hecarim. Their carries do a lot of damage, so hopefully that, I think, is the angle that they're going for here. Now, let's address the elf in the room. Or should I say, the cat in the bush. The Iron <laughs> Rengar coming out in full uh you don't see rengar a lot especially top lane um and pairing with the ivern you know that's a classic combo you can place bushes for the ivern for the uh, rengar to jump out of so it can be very effective it's how they utilize it that's really going to be the deciding factor here. and going for more more dive is an interesting idea however i will point out that sejuani seraphine hecram can also help with this anti-dive hecram known for his aggressive offensive play with the onslaught of shadows onto a back line or onto mobile carries but really that's also a great peel tool it flees people away and provides a lot of cc and you can be frontline taking a bunch of hits and then just boom 
You go and help mm -hmm. out your back line. So Ascendant 5 got a really good comp to sort of deal with this aggressive gameplay from USF White. And personally, their draft, first impression wise, is looking pretty nice. I'm I'm gonna argue uh, in favor of USF White here. Actually, just uh, again, just they have so much dive that I think it would be pretty. Uh, I think it's impossible for Hecarim to peel everyone off of their carries. You have Lissandra diving in. You have Tristana. You have Abu Abu. You have Redgar. And honestly, you have Daisy diving in as well too. So mm -hmm. I think if if we're going from a draft standpoint, I actually have to side with USF White on this one. I just think they should be able. As long as they're the ones engaging, they should be able to just dash it and just delete the carries on the side of Ascendant 5. However, you are correct in the in the way that if the peel is done correctly for the side of Ascendant 5, I actually think their draft might be a bit stronger. Uh -huh. And this question of correctly versus incorrectly comes down to the argument of how easy a comp is to play and how important that is in the types of ELO matches. And I can completely agree with you on the fact that I think USF Weiss comps is way easier to think about, conceptualize, and finally execute in the game. They have every single one of their members playing for dive. Ivern mm -hmm. may be the exception, but he can still walk forward and play aggressively and mm -hmm. not really be in too much threat. Um, but USF White comp is just completely... Focused on one simple goal. And because of this ELO rating and this ELO average, you would naturally assume that something that works well together is something that all has the same primary goal. And I think that's where UFSF comp really has the edge here. And I, th and I think also you got to keep in mind the Ivern Rengar combo. Rengar does better at brushes. Ivern spots them up. So that is definitely something to look out for. Not only do they have to be wary around regular brushes with a Rengar, they got to keep in mind, if Ivern's around, Rengar could dive in from anywhere on the map. Mm -hmm. And Miss Fortune, here, uh, here's the thing, right? Is that you can argue she should run cleanse here, and I would agree with that she was run cleanse. She's kind of derailing the conversation a little bit, my apologies. But I think it's an important <laughs> thing to talk about, especially with the composition that USF White has. They have so much lockdown in CC that the cleanse seems like an obvious pick, the pro but the problem is, is even if you cleanse one ability, like the Amumu ult, you still have Frozen Tomb. You still have the Ivern Snare. You still have all these slows and these CCs that it's going to be very hard to really keep yourself from uh, keep yourself alive, especially since some of these CCs are point and click, right? Exactly. Amumu is sort of an AOE ultimate, but if he's in range, it's basically point and click. You have to flash out of it early. Lissandra, Frozen Tomb, literally point and click. So a mobile carries especially suffer, and so do mobile carries really, but especially the mobile ones who need to commit flashes for stuff like Amumu. Mm -hmm. So uh, we are just hopping into a uh, three-minute delay. So let's talk a bit more um, about your predictions. So, like, draft the side, or, I mean, obviously drafts should be included in predicting, but just your, orig your original uh, feeling. Who do you think will take game one in this series? I think personally, from my perspective... And I know I'm panicked for time with that original statement, but I do actually believe that USF White does have the edge here because of their ease of execution. And I think overall their comp is like Ascendant 5 is more traditional, you know. You got scaling mid, uh, you have a pretty good scaling bot because of the Seraphine. You have tank top, you have a engaging jungler. It's very traditional, very textbook. Uh, however, it's textbook is not always easy. You go to college and textbooks are hard to read sometimes. So even though it's been set in stone and it's been written, it's a lot harder to follow than, I guess, the analogy would be the picture book of USF White's comp. Very easy to follow. And so I think they will have the edge, despite someone could argue at the top level that Ascendant 5 has the advantage. I really have to redeem myself because after last week, I was wrong in both of my predictions. So I'm not as omniscient as I would like to be. So... I am going with my gut, even though you sided with them as well. I, I think that USF White will take game one here. Mm -hmm. Just like like you said, I believe it's an easier draft to execute. It's more, hey, look, there's misfortune. Everyone go. And then just deleting her before anything can happen. So I just think that's an easier, the kind of pick comp that they've built here is a bit easier. Team fighting, if they go into a 5v5 team fight, then obviously I favor Ascendant 5. They have way more team fighting tools than the Seraphine Ultimate, the Misfortune, Victor even, um, Hecarim, obviously. So I think in a 5v5, I do uh, put my put my money on Ascendant 5. However, USF White has just so many pick potentials that it should never get to a 5v5 fight for objectives. So I am on the side of USF White. 
If I go 0-3 on my predictions, I'm going to be really sad, and I will just stop uh, guessing from there on out, and I'll just uh, say I, whoever wins, wins, because whoever obviously wins. I do not know how to read this. <laughs> whoever wins does win, but one thing we want to go before, before we go into the game here pretty soon in about 40 seconds is that I would like to point out that last time uh, that team plays... No, USF White was... Wasn't USF White the team we did last cast, or no? Uh, no, we did... Uh, it was Clarity Black and Big Bongo yeah. Boys. Yeah, Big Bongo Boys. But what I want to point out is that we saw the Amumu versus Seraphine Misfortune map matchup already play out. And you have to wonder on the side of Ascended 5, I don't know how successful it is for other series, but at least the series that we watched, the Amumu was constantly winning those bot lane fights and carrying that into the late game. So they picked... A side of the matchup that was not really successful the last time we witnessed it absolutely and um it looks like uh, just in order to uh uh get into the uh game we will just have to go to a very quick break we will be back as, as soon as we can we will be right back welcome back to the risen recap today we're looking towards risen unstoppable and the stream started off with a Wake bang up. quicksand asleep it's it's the first game of Unstoppable Risen Pre-Made! Come on, get up, come but on, come I gotta on. say, he was smooth once he rolled into it. Wow. And our first series was Big Bongo Boys playing up against Clarity Black. For the first yeah, 20 minutes, minutes of the game, it was a bit of fighting in the top lane, but not much happened besides that. Oh, but the engage coming out from Sejuani, but it's traded back, and Maokai actually regenerated a lot more health than I would expect it there. For Boxer Squirrel, just really, those kind of impacts making a huge uh, difference in the gold. Yeah, and I don't know whether I want to call them Triple B, BBB, or Big Bongo Boys, because they're all, actually, they're not all same song. Big, big Bongo then there was a mega turnaround fight for the Big Bongo boys after they made a big dragon attempt, but then they got challenged again for the dragon attempt, which Big Bongo Big Bongo now, boys won the fight towards. On this side, and there's a 3 on the other side, but I can't punch it, and I can't punch it. But Boxer Crow in the midst of all, unable to get too much out, but finds the Q before his class dies, and Chicken Fried Rice to his teeth with good depth does not unfortunately have the W enough up to heal up. And the call comes back in the circuit, but finds one. Can she find two? No, she gets shut down, and the exchange of lives is so insane. Can Maokai find? And we are getting back into the action. Both teams sprinting it down a bot side. Sticking as a five man unit. We don't see the traditional five point. Oh, but in terms boy. of level one. I oh, said look. some level one shenanigans here. It's the tri bush. The, oh, oh, I. Oh, who's gonna get? Who's gonna get the edge here? They have an Ivan versus and a Rengar, so it might be a little bit tough to want to go for this. As all five v five roll, the Amumu with the gauge, but he's in the midst of so many members reengages. But that is a sure sacrifice of his life. It's traded one back. The Huckram dealing a lot of damage with his AOE abilities, but he might be taken low, and now he is taken down. Are they going to trade one back onto the Rengar? They're able to find it. It's a three for th three, but now it is a two v two. And look, they might be able to take out Prince. The Hailblades gets back on the front of the flash forward. One more auto will kill, and it does. But the auto surely going to trade. Back no, but the triumph allowed to start to live just enough for Ivern to finish it off for the rest of the team. It's a five v five bloodbath, and USF come out on top. That is the League of Legends we have been waiting for. That's the level one we want to see. Nine deaths before the minion spawn is just—you uh, do not see that in a lot of these games. So that is just crazy. That is about as even as it can go. Five for four in favor of USF. Oh my goodness, that was just, you could see it building up. That was an amazing way to start this game. Yeah, it was such an insane, exciting action. But as I pointed out at the start of it, if you're going into a Rengar in the Invade, it can be pretty troublesome because of how we can hop between the bushes. And he has a lot of really great level one tools. But unfortunately, if you are USF, like you probably would have wanted those kills to be on someone else to, instead of the Ivern. But overall, they also probably got first blood based on the gold difference that we saw there. Um, and unfortunately, I just noticed, I think, do you notice what I noticed here? I it's think I noticed the same thing. I, I believe that Astro Hailstorm has not bought any items. So, uh, oh. unless that was not what you noticed. <laughs> Yeah, that is exactly what I was referring to. Astronautilus getting pushed in and also <laughs> getting <laughs> bullied out of lane. Has no items, you fool! You must base soon enough! But has access to the TP, so... Yeah, that is a bit of an oopsie on the side of Astro Hailstorm, but, uh, you know, with that tank matchup, it's uh, not the end of the world. He is not going to be the main carry of this game. But, yes, that is definitely not what you want to see. 
Uh, maybe that would have been enough to switch the tide over into his team's favor, but either way, that, that is rough for Astro Hailstorm. It's going to be a tough lane for him. Yeah, that's going to be really tough. It's even going to be tougher. A lot of pressure on him, but even more pressure being applied by Duralumen, allowing his jungler, because they are both junglers are pathing topside here, so they both potentially looking for the scuttle, but the one that has prior on the topside is that Rankar, but in the mid lane, it is all Victor. So we could see a 2v2 brawl turn into 3v3 real fast on the top side. Uh, with uh, Imaginary Champ backing up, it doesn't look like we will have as big of a brawl, but... As I would have uh, yes, with that Pryo in the top lane. It actually has swapped over. Astro Hailstorm is pushing this in. He has a level up on the Rengar, but uh, again, just no items. He is at a huge disadvantage. And here comes Ivern and Hecarim. This will be interesting. Yeah, they want this is a 2v2 fight here, but the Ivern and the Rengar surely to be favored. The shield comes out, but the level lead is on the side of Astro, and they are just bursting him before he can even get back to the bush to apply more damage. The Ivern wants another one. He wants to trade one back, but will he be able to find it? Yes, he does, but he trades his own life in the end. It's a one for 2 but the Tristana and the Amu with the comp we talked about early in the game, getting those aggressive kills, find one. So it is a 2v2 overall for everyone uh, across the map. But finally, Astro Hailstorm is able to be back in base and get some items. He will get the Dorn Shield along with the uh, Ionian Boots of Lucidity. So um, definitely <laughs> a bit rough for him at the beginning. But now finally with some items under his belt, hopefully he will be able to get back into this game. The Clown Fiesta has started and the, and the blood is flying. And the deaths are... The people are falling on the floor everywhere. This is such a bloody game. I already start. This is what I want to see. Total kill. You already seen. Oh, but imaginary champ looking to take out Duralumen once again. He's trying to run back to his base and true back to his tower in time, but it's just not enough. Gets taken down by Hailstorm. No items at the start, but definitely still looking up for him. I mean, considering he had no items up, he is only about 200 gold up over his adversary in uh, Duralumen, but. Yeah, you're right. With Considering the start Astor Hailstorm had, gotta give credit where credit's due. I think he responded very well, and now that he has items again, is really performing at the level he needs to be. Mm -hmm. And Choo Choo Chlain. Doing, getting some vision control on the bot side. Could potentially look for this dragon here. Cha Cha, unfortunately missing the bandage. Toss getting slowed up, taking a little bit of damage. Won't be able to look for the re-engage. And we're gonna be seeing some trades back and forth on the bot side, but the real idea and the concept of this matchup if you're the misfortune seraphine you need to poke out this amumu so that when he goes in he's not going to be able to get out in time you want to be able to burst them down in order for tristana to have no one help no help to follow her up but misfortune and seraphine have not done that just yet no unfortunately uh with range supports you always want to look for more poke just because especially with hard hard engagers like the amumu um, the lower the health he has, the weaker his engages. So you definitely want to look for more of that poke angle, but it looks like we do have a crowd gathering in the bot lane, but uh, with them backing off, it doesn't look like anything will come of it quite yet. And Ivern showing himself on the top side. This could eventually spell trouble for Hailstorm, but a quick dash out. But now that they spot Ivern on the top side, blue team could potentially look for the play here. She, she, it is a 4v3, change? so I believe it will, will be a dragon... Uh, going over to the side of... Ooh, I, uh, I'm blanking on their name right Ascended now. Ascended 5. Ascended 5. Thank you, As Ascended 5. Uh, I believe it should be a dragon going over to them, especially with Ivern showing in the top lane. He does have a lot of his camps to collect on the bot side, so we may see something, but I believe the dragon will just get deleted before he can get there. In an early dragon take, you don't see those too often in, in those higher levels of game. Most people prioritize with Herald, but we see a top side fight the ignite does get ticked down he tries to cleanse it off with that w but overall loses the trade and is forced to flash out yeah definitely a bit rougher uh, dura lumen at this point of the game um you know with the repeated gags from imaginary champ uh, no doubt he's going to be pretty far behind but definitely a bit of a struggle for him at this moment he does still have a cs lead so hopefully he can take advantage of that and what I would like to point out to our dear viewers is this Victor and Lissandra matchup. Despite the fact that it was so bloody in the other game, and we would say USF on top, the big winner of that invade is, in fact, Mint. 
he does have a lot of gold to it on his belt, but we see a top side fight. The Sejuani ult wants to make it a one for one, but can she find the necessary damage? No. Durlumen going into the ulti, waiting for his time to strike, and he finds it and stabs a knife in her back, finding the kill, but Ekron with the Onslaught of Shadows just burst out. The Lestrange not able to get out of that situation at Lola Cha Cha, running for his life. Oh, the Banish off stopwatch stone a little bit of time. A good wow. flash to get out of the cage and the stun and stalls for his life and does so successfully. So some fancy feet on this side. Oh man, I'm blanking on their name again. It's uh, Ascendant 5 versus, yep. I need to write this, I need to write this down next time. But uh, on the red on the red side, Dura Lumen coming up with that heal at the last second to save his own life, and then the stopwatch on the side of Lachacha was actually quite incredible. Followed up by the flash to keep himself alive, and it was USF White, of course. Yes, I am. I'm, I am trolling. I apologize. <laughs> no, you're good. You're good. You're good. It happens. <laughs> But the big winner, I would like to point out, is Victor. He's two kills up and 10 CS over his lane opponent. And also more effective in the late game than something like Lissandra. I mean, you can argue that Lissandra is more effective because of the CC lock and those potential utility that she provides. But if you're looking for pure damage, look no further than Victor. Uh, terrorizing competitive play uh, a long ago. Not long ago. Pretty recently, actually. For a long stretch of time, he did dominate competitive play in terms of mid lane control mages. Provided so much burst damage but another good control mage is Lissandra and she does have these pools to potentially make a comeback for her team absolutely uh like we said at the beginning just with Lissandra's ultimate uh, followed up by all the dive that is on the side of USF white just and the ability to just absolutely shut down one of these carries on the side of Ascendant 5 I have to say their names so I keep remembering them <laughs> um, absolutely. Um, we got a5 in USF both duking it out. No team's really putting priority to the Herald. Do you think this is a mistake or a smarter play just to say, hey, let's put our priorities elsewhere than getting this objective? I am a uh, Rift Herald aficionado. I believe that it is one of the most uh, undervalued objectives in the early game. Of course, post-14, it's guaranteed gold for whoever you want to put it on your team. So I, I've always prioritized early Rift Heralds. It does look like... Uh, the Iron is starting it up now, but I always try my best to put a uh, early emphasis on Rift Heralds because I just believe they are so undervalued. But here we go. It's a slugfest in the top side. The Victor ulti comes down a little prematurely, though. Rangar ulti wants to find in, finds a little bit of damage there, but not enough to really burst him down. Forced to back out. Daisy is the front line, making it a 3v2. The bushes are chaining perfectly, but this is the ult to allow themselves to escape that scenario. Is really great because it stalls out oh. this Rift Herald, and now they can make the play bot side. A great ult from the Cha Cha does not unfortunately keep him alive because the bullet time is what will finish him off. And it is coming up for A5 in this mid game. Uh, yeah, just checking the brush, not knowing three of the enemy team were there. That is a bit unfortunate for the Cha Cha, just trying to protect his ADC. But it looks like they will be able to score an objective on the other side of the map now that uh, the Hecarim has shown himself. Yep. And despite all the stalling that they had, as you said, Harold taken. But which member was put on? It was this Rangar. They want to put all the resources in Dura Lumen. You said that's guaranteed gold. I am inclined to agree. If you place it on the tower while you have the wave pushed, that's around three plates put into your pocket. Oftentimes, we see the junglers take it so they can pick and choose where they want in the map depending on the game state. But they're saying, no, we know this Rengar is what will keep us in this game. So we're going to put all our effort into him. Uh, over a thousand gold up. If you look at that CS lead that Duraluren has accumulated in the top lane, uh, he's definitely have a significant lead over Astro Hailstorm at this time. And it's just going to be even more once this Herald has been dropped. But it looks like they are just uh, training blows for now. We'll see if something comes up from yeah, it but later on doesn't seem like too much is gonna and despite being a thousand gold ahead is losing put it simple put it simply but the imaginary champ is looking to engage here lachacha bandage tossing trying to fall it out lucas on to the misfortune but the exhaust are in both 80 carries and she's not able to find the kill as the misfortune flashes over the wall and now it is the chase can they find any more kills it looks like that answer will be no doing a little bit of poke damage for walking away here and this dragon is on. Here comes Mint. That is absolutely right. And finds the first damage onto the Ivern. The rest of his team could not clean up those kills, but he says, no, I can certainly. 
Vlad is just some really good teamwork on this side of Ascendant 5. Just rotating down, finding those kills around the objective. Just really good picks. Well, I gotta give credit where credit's due once again. Just a really well played by Ascendant 5. Yep. They might have played the initial 5v5 that you don't often see. A little bit sloppy, but they are certainly cleaning up this mid game. This Hecarim putting so much pressure on this bot side. You've seen him a lot down there. And Ivan has tried to retaliate, but he's just been a little too late or in worse positions on these plays. Really been a pretty big jungle diff, at least in my opinion, especially when you take and factor the CS difference. I mean, Hecarim will clear faster than Ivern. That is just that is just a given. Um, especially since Ivern uh, taking on more of a support role does not actually need farm to be effective. Uh, but 100%, just the imaginary champ has been active on all parts of the map. He's been involved in 10 of the 11 kills on his team that is just some incredible kill participation definitely outperforming his adversary at this moment but we'll see if uh, the Ivern can uh recover a little bit and see if he can influence the map in a another way hmm. well sandra i was gonna point her out because he looked like she was walking up to potentially make a play but opts to walk back in the mid lane to catch the wave and it is the hecarim on the top side as well as the Ivern. this rift herald is the next major thing that you got to keep your eyes on if you are looking to see who's going to win this game. Can they get it down effectively? And the answer is actually no. The plates have yes. already fallen off 15 seconds ago. Yes, unfortunately, Dura Lumen not able to push the wave in against Astro Hailstorm. So well done by the Ascendant 5 top laner to keep that gold in the pocket of Dura Lumen. But it looks like Dura Lumen wants it over. But here we go. find a lot of damage, but does have the numbers necessary. And in response, it is now a 4v3 situation. And he got them in a pincer move. Lissandra is the first to fall among many. And Lachacha is the second. Victor picking up two in this river fight. And if A5 will to clay, cl take a stake in this mid game. Dank Candle with the perfect Seraphine ultimate, getting on into all three members of USF White in that fight. An absolute brilliant ultimate there to seal the deal and take that objective. Well done by Dank Candle. Finally, the Rift Herald is summoned, but unfortunately it's in his own base, so I don't even know if he'll get any use out of this Rift Herald at all. And the name of the game of mid game is, or at least mid to late game, is this idea of siege and if we're looking at which team siege is better i would have to give that of course to a5 miss fortune can siege pretty well she has zoning abilities which is a part of the reason you want part of the thing you want in siege because with siege you want to put a lot of pressure or you want to have a lot of range and they definitely can apply pressure with this comp absolutely and especially since uh the pick comp of oh you actually might have some action here in the top lane yeah where i finished my point but apparently not <laughs> so uh, especially with the pick comp that uh usf white is running in this game uh just the uh, objectives are just going to be so tough if they cannot find these picks if they cannot kill mint or prince or even imaginary champ before the objective spawns it's just gonna be so hard for them to win these fights i'm talking about objectives dragon spawning in next minute and 20 ish seconds gonna be the third dragon of the game and a5 already has two if usf uh -oh. want to get back in the game, they... oh prince wants to try to make something happen on that ivern but can't find the damage necessary the ivern forced the flash out in that situation it could come back to bite him a little bit later but as we look at some of the items what do you think of this decision to go Shirelia's Battle Song rather than Moonstone? Good? Bad? And why do you I think that's okay? I actually prefer it on Ivern, in my opinion. I'm not a big fan of the mobility boots, even though I understand why a lot of people do like them. But as far as the Shirelia goes, I think there there isn't a uh, ton of mobility or disengage on the side of... Um, I, I mean, actually, now that I think about it, Tristana has decent disengage. Amumu, if used right, doesn't have to be the engage and can be the disengage. In fact, I think you're actually right. I'm not a big fan of the Shirelias, and I think Moonstone may have been better just to add a bit more healing and support to his team. Mm -hmm. And yes, it's 20 seconds. We see both teams putting all five members down here. TPs be damned. There is only one up, and it is on Mint, and he is down here. No, he is pushing mid. 
with the team could potentially teleport for a flank play but that is not what victor is known for and they're looking to engage early on to lachacha might be the one one member come out but he does have the ability to get out but oh, victor turning. is in a bad spot in the air turning it but the victor burst damage is so much he's able to flash out and imaginary champ is able to help his team member into the back line picks up two hailstorm trying to find chuchala and the four and the tristana forced to jump out prince cleans up the last kill and it is turning up a five and they look to take this dragon Again, if you cannot find those picks with your pick comp, you should not be engaging in a 5v5 evidence yet again as USF White is just slaughtered in that fight. Astro Hailstorm finds the pick on to Lachacha and well played. That is now the third dragon going over to the side of Ascendant 5. This is a rough, rough spot now for USF White. They are going to have to get desperate if they want a chance in this game down 5k gold but what i would like to point out about the fight is is two things specifically uh one of the main things that i noticed was especially the fact that like you know you saw victor on that flank position we all thought he was dead instantly they had the Lissandra, they had the Tristana, they had the burst damage but the problem with engaging onto a lone member is you leave yourself exposed to the rest of the team and using all your engaged tools on one member even when that member has used every one of their ability he already used laser and ulti so most of his damage is already take is already put down onto the field so, despite the fact that they could have maybe gotten the pick there, the fight still probably would have gone awry, even if they picked them off. Absolutely, but the thing is, when you go in like that, you need to kill him fast enough to be able to turn onto the enemy team. But just Victor would have died in that fight. A good flash from mid gets him out safe and sound, and it's just a three for nothing in favor of Ascendant 5. They grab the Dragon, they grab the Rift Herald, they are now up almost 6,000 gold. This is going to be very, very tough, and we'll see if uh, anybody on USF White can help out their team, but it now Illumin Mint against their Illumin. He wants to go for this play, though, but he's taking so much damage already from the Victor, but the Victor, using his movement tools and his abilities, wants to get out of here, but Doom Illumin is on the hunt, wants the auto, the Q, one oh. more auto will finish it off. And despite that fight looking rough at the start, he cleans it up in the end. That is a 600 gold shutdown going into the pocket of Dura Lumen. Perhaps this Rengar is the saving grace that they are waiting for, but we'll have to see if that pays off as now we have action in the bot lane as well. Yep, Chi is just trying to run here, knows that he cannot win this fight at all. And if he loses that, that's a crucial cooldown of a member on the side of USF that they can't afford to lose right now. The Rengar clawing his way back, trying his best, but this next objective in the Baron Nasher, Vision Control is the name of the game here. And if you want to look to close this out, you want to look to close it out with a Baron on your side. Absolutely. I think that is the next objective in mind. Of course, oh, here we go. Perhaps, no. Quick it's escape the, there for cheese. <laughs> it's Cassandra versus Sejuani. It was like that top lane brawl in the last game. You know something's <laughs> happening to you. You know nothing really is happening there. Uh, hey, able to I remember escape. last week the top laners were actually fighting quite a lot. It was uh, two tanky boys and they just wouldn't die. It was quite interesting, but they were fighting a lot. Yeah, they're fighting a ton, but bodies didn't really drop in that top side. But getting back that to this correct. game itself, yeah. uh, we have them spawning the Rift Herald mid. This misfortune wants to get the gold in her own pockets. And putting that pressure mid allows them to walk up to the Baron here and start to take it. All right, here we go. Does they look to go for the fight, or rather, would they go for the steal? It looks like based on the positioning of Ivan, they want to go for this fight. The Shraldius is popped early, and Lissandra looks to maybe engage. Doesn't find the rest of the part of the Ila Chacha engaging onto a couple. Doesn't get enough damage. Oh Nesca's Barry and the Wabo combo is just too much for USF to handle in this game one. They look to chase them down. Can they catch more? And they do, and it's a Quadra for Imaginary Champ on this Hecarim, and they are taking Baron. Heck a rib OP. Well played there on the side of Ascendant 5. Just a wombo combo, like we said at the beginning. And in a 5v5, there just shouldn't be any contest. Ascendant 5 have the better team fight elements with the Hecarim, with the Misfortune, with the Seraphine. Just absolutely decimating that fight. And down goes USF White, the Baron buff. Let's see what they can do with it. Yep. It's a 10k gold lead. But as we actually heard earlier before this commentary even started, 
10k gold leads being thrown is not totally unfamiliar to this uh, uh, casting that, desk. That, that, that hits a little close to home. Oh, I told you that in confidence. <laughs> yes. We don't talk but, about my solo queue games on, on, on broadcast, okay? <laughs> we can talk about them a little bit later because Red Team wants to look to make a retaliation play. They have three members sent up to take out a missionary champion who's doing so much stuff crucial. They have the lockdown, they have the CC, they have the frozen tomb, and they have everything. But imaginary champ is healing so much. Oh. <laughs> Barely doesn't trade one back, and I swear, if he got one of those, he would have definitely gotten all three. Uh, again, it's just with the pick potential on the side of USF White, it doesn't matter how far ahead you are. Lissandra can just select one person and just say, you cannot play this game. And Luma, see, on the right. I am shocked that it almost didn't work. Imaginary Champ just so beefy on this hacker rib. Almost managed to turn the 1v3, but unfortunately does get picked by the side of USF White. And they can't really do anything, but Seraphine's in kind of a weird, awkward spot, but a great double root yeah, onto three. That was, like, that was a triple root. Are we just gonna ignore that? Okay. <laughs> yeah, that was kind of that was kind of insane. Like the Seraphine's gonna pop it off here. Uh, but they're just stalling out time for the Hecarim to respawn because this is the dragon for the soul. The fight's going to happen around across the map, but it is so much poke damage. The Victor Laser, the Daisy. Seraphine abilities. It's so much for them to handle, and it's turned from poke to burst, and the Chacha's forced to flash out. Luca, the next member to potentially be taken down, and he get, does fall by the hands of Victor with the rest of his team trying to escape the Lissandra with the E. The Frozen Passage, will it allow her to pass back into her base? And that is a no. Misfortune trying to clean up the last of these kills before the dragon is taken. And they do. And they don't care about the dragon because they can just end the game right here and right now. Oh my goodness. Just the 5v5 potential of this game. I think we need to start stop doing predictions because uh, we, as we learned from last week, our caster curses uh, can be a bit too strong. Mm -hmm. So I... Uh, I do feel bad for the side of USF White, you can blame that one on us, but game one going over to Ascended 5, well played by them. And really well played indeed. Let's see how USF just in the draft in game two. Before that, we will probably take a quick break? I would assume so, but if not, then we'll just talk a little bit more on the analyst desk, we'll see what's going on here. And how do you feel about that first game? Do you feel like... You know, Ascendant 5, pretty dominant fashion. It was a little scuffed in the early game, but they were able to pull it out and take a convincing lead in terms of the mid-game. How do you think USF White needs to respond? Uh, I think putting all your eggs into a pick comp basket and not, not playing it the way you're supposed to is just a bit rough, obviously. They, they did try to go for picks. Like, I'm not saying that they played it incorrectly. It's just once they got behind the April, it was really hard for them to recover. Um, they did try to go for picks. We saw like it worked sometimes, like the three man on the Hecker Rib that almost didn't work because at mm -hmm. that point they were very far behind. But uh, just finding those picks before the objectives are so important. That is why generally team fighting comps are easier to execute in uh, instead of uh, pick comps. But pick comps should trump over team fighting comps if executed correctly. So. I think if you go for that kind of uh, pick comp on the side, like uh, the side of USF White did, you really got to execute it before the objective spawns or else it will turn into a 5v5 fight where the superior team fighting power of the Victor, Misfortune, Seraphine, Hecarim, and honestly the Setuani as well will just triumph in that, in that scenario. And I do completely agree with you. It's a pick comp that they pick. Draft-wise, I think they had maybe a little bit of edge. Argue could be argued the other side, but the execution was really what kind of wavered in terms of those fights. And a 5v5 brawl at the start really does kind of imply a thing about both these teams is they want to brawl and they want to win the early game. So how do you think these teams will adjust to that? Do you think one team will decide, hey, if y'all are going to play very aggressive early, let's back up and let's play to scale and let's kind of not really play to fight you too early on, or do both teams try to double down and keep to play this aggressive style that they've been showing throughout this first game? I mean, if it ain't broke, don't fix it on the side of Ascended 5, I think. Uh, I I highly doubt we will see that Hecarim again. That champion is just too broken at this moment to see it uh, go through the draft phase once again. Um so I don't think they will get uh, the exact... I don't think we will be seeing a similar draft than what we saw in game one. Uh, however, 
I think if it ain't broke, don't fix it. We saw the superior team fighting capabilities of the side of Ascendant 5. I think if you stick to a similar sort of comp, you know, uh, with the wombo combo potential that they have, I think they executed that flawlessly. It was a bit rough at the beginning because they did lose the level one fight, obviously. So a um, bit rough, but they recovered excellently. Astro Hailstorm not buying items also set them a bit behind in that regard, but he recovered very well, and Duralumin just couldn't uh, close out his winning lane, and Astro Hailstorm just absolutely played the way he had to in order for them to win that game. So if I am on the side of uh, Ascendant 5, I think they are going with a similar comp. Something definitely has to change for uh, USF. Uh, I just... I don't know what they would do, though. That's the only thing. I potentially have an idea, and it's not necessarily draft-wise, but playing-wise. You saw them play around that top lane, Rangar, like he was God's gift from Earth, but he wasn't playing to that level that they put the resources in. That Tristan in the bot lane, though, she was playing at a pretty decent level. She had some kills in the early game. They were able to win those 2v2 fights, and if you put a little bit more resources onto protecting that Tristana, maybe that could have been an avenue for a win con. But putting a lot of resources into a Rengar who was losing those 1v1s topside, despite his lane opponent not having any items, it could spell a different kind of playstyle. And especially since your team is so early into the league, um, you can definitely try to go for more of these crazy playstyles that you don't conventionally run. Maybe they all agreed, let's play around top lane. We're a top lane team. But it's all about finding your style, and I think that's going to be crucial coming into this next game. Absolutely. Um... Unfortunately, we do have to go to a quick break before we can jump into game two. I'm excited. I hope we do get a three-game series, but uh, we will see what will happen in the next one. Hopefully, USF has a better answer for us and we have a bit more of a competitive game. But until then, we will see you guys in a few moments. Welcome back to the Risen Recap. Today, we're looking towards Risen Unstoppable, and the stream started off with a Wait bang, up. quicksand, asleep. It's, it's the first game of Unstoppable Risen Premade. Come on, get up, come But on, come I gotta on. say, he was smooth once he rolled into it. Wow. And our first series was big bongo boys playing up against Clarity Black. For the first yeah, 20 minutes of the game, it was a bit of fighting in the top lane, but not much happened besides that. Oh, but the engage coming out from Sejuani, but it's traded back. And Malkai actually regenerated a lot more health than I would expect it there. For Boxer Squirrel, just really, those kind of impacts making a huge uh, difference in the gold. Yeah, and I don't know whether I want to call them Triple B, BBB, or Big Bongo Boys, because they're all... Actually, they're not all same song. Big Bongo Boys. Then there was a mega turnaround fight for the Big Bongo Boys after they made a Big Dragon attempt, but then they got challenged again for the Dragon attempt, which Big Bongo Big Bongo Boys won the fight towards. On this side, and there's a 3 on the other side, but I can't cut to it, and I can't cut to it. But Boxer Crow in the midst of all, unable to get too much out, but finds the Q before he's last dies, and Chicken Fried Rice to his team with good depth, does not unfortunately have the W enough up to heal up, and the call comes back in the circuit, but finds one, can she find two? No, she gets shut down, and the exchange of lives is so insane, can Maokai find the damage to triple back, and he does, but unfortunately, it is the ace on the side of CLB that allows them to get this dragon. Much later in the game, Big Bongo Boys chased Akali down in the bot lane, meaning that Clarity Black had so much freedom to take that first Baron, and from that Baron, they spiraled away from a team fight and took the victory. The higher ranked uh, Clarity Black and uh, honestly still performing Akali. extremely well. Oh, and she can't get out simply, tries to ulti over the wall, but that's crucial. Four men were sent down. This is the freest Baron I've seen. It's incredibly hard to siege anything. As we're talking about that, the Dragon does in fact fall. This will be a very important fight. Dragon Soul on the line. Let's see. This is so easy. And the onslaught of shadows into all of the members. We talk about Wombo on one side. We talk about Wombo on the other side. But the whole time is not correctly pinned on enough members to make it worth it and to make it so they can make this comeback. And unfortunately, at the end, CLB take the they don't. and they look to take the game. And then as we rolled into game two, Maokai was picked again. Welcome to the League of Legends Champion Spotlight, featuring Maokai, the Twisted Triant. Maokai is a support tank hybrid. That's why he's the GOAT! The GOAT! Bold move. Overall, Normally Darius is only reserved for those uh, counter picks, and it looks like they're just going to respond with Maokai. 
And the team was entirely green, so they kind of had the aesthetic advantage for the big bongo boys. For the first 22 minutes, I kind of got distracted watching the LCS. 100 Thieves did win, to a big surprise of all the casters. And then we moved back into the game, where Baron and Swordpoint were both hit here by CLB. Towards this dragon, uh, we do have good death running up from base. Let's see if we can get here in time. And this dragon is down to 9k HP. They opt to pull it out, so the potential steal is a lot has a lot less potential to happen. The Maokai ulti for the engage. They want to make this happen. The Wombo combo. But the bullet time is just barely out of range. But it's not going to matter in the end. The death ball comes too strong. But this Twitch is free firing in the back line. Good death trying to stall time for his AD carry. But in a 1v4 when you're already routed and they're already on top of you. They make it look easy. With CLB taking a massive victory in the second game. And this series. It seemed like the casters had gone to Hogwarts. Because every single time they were casting and made predictions. They just put a caster curse down on Poor big and bongo the boys. series is taken by Clarity Black. And that was Risen Unstoppable for the night. Hey everybody and welcome back to the Risen Recap. Today we're looking towards Risen Unstoppable and the stream started off with a Wake bang, up. quicksand, a sleep. It's, it's the first game of Unstoppable Risen Pre-Made. Come on. Welcome back. We are getting set for game two between... Uh, Ascendant 5 and USF White. We are going to uh, do something a little bit different in the cast this time around. I'm actually going to try the play-by-play -play while my partner Slotty, he will actually be your analyst for this game. We are just mixing it up a bit, trying out uh, some different elements. So uh, I'm really excited because I think I'll really enjoy play-by-play. -play, but mm -hmm. uh, Slotty, how are you? Are you feeling confident for becoming an analyst now? or? Uh Hopefully my 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 big ass forehead will come into use here. Uh, we'll, <laughs> we'll see we'll see how it goes. But yeah, um, I do play okay, this that's game. A, that's a way of thinking about it. But <laughs> I I do play this game a lot. I also watch a lot of um, cast in like terms of what was it? I watch a lot of LCS, which is not the hallmark for uh, high competitive play. It's more so in in the eastern regions, but you still can find a lot of good information. But the gangplank yeah, banned it, early. I out. will defend the LCS and say they are slightly better than me, not by much, mm. just slightly. Just a little bit, <laughs> just a little bit better. But the same bands are kind of thrown around, and we are swapped from red to blue side. Uh, recently, mm -hmm. there's kind of been a blue side renaissance in terms of the LCS, where teams will often pick blue side because of the predominance of camps like Zeri, Yumi. Uh, Zeri, like Zeri Yumi, who, uh, who's the others? Lulu and Sivert. But, interestingly enough, we're not in the LCS and those champs aren't played. So, what? Blue Side is still, <laughs> Blue Side is still wanting to, uh, the fact that this team, despite losing, still wants to go for Blue Side, does communicate the strength of this side, uh, in the current meta. Ah, uh, yes. Yeah, so, taking out some of those comforts yet again. Misfortune, gone. We're not seeing her again. Vigar, uh, which was Cheese's number one pick, gone. Hecarim. God, we are not seeing that OP champion in this game. And instead, that would be a very interesting first pick. And it has picked up the Mordekaiser. So definitely not to what you would expect from a first pick. Uh, what's your take on a, on a Mordekaiser first pick here? I think it is absolutely trolling. Okay, if I'm going to be quite frank here, I think picking Mordekaiser first pick, there's so many counters to him that it gets pretty ridiculous to pick him first pick unless... They want to take it as a power pick. Are they worried about Ascended 5 potentially playing it? Could be the angle I could see. But I don't think it's a really strong first pick. Especially once, since you want to pick a, a top laner much later into the draft. As we see, the Yumi picked up. Yeah, like something like a Yumi I think is just way stronger of a first pick. The amount of ADCs that she has synergy with. Or Udyr, another great would have been first pick. And both of these powerful picks now... Going to the side of Ascendant 5, just, I'm not 100% not sure what the plan is here for USF, but I'm sure we will see it as the rest of the draft begins to round out. And Yumi Udir, a combo that we had a lot pre-rework. Uh, Udir has really fast, really, like, really great stun, his old version. And so Yumi pairing onto him, allowing him to speed even further, basically makes the champion more of that champion. I like to see how it plays out in terms of mm. Udyr Yumi new one. We see the Janna in vain locked in. So I, I've seen a bit of a uh, a bit of a change from the mindset of USF. Instead of going all dive, all dive, they have a lot of peel this time around. Mordekaiser ultimate, uh, Janna as a champion, 
condemn from Vayne E. Just a lot of ways to keep uh, their carries alive this time around instead of deleting the opposing carries. So a bit of an interesting strategy shift here. We'll see if that pays off as Zeri is picked out to round out the first uh, three picks on each side. So we are going to have a Yumi Zeri in the bot lane. I have not seen Zeri since her nerfs. I don't think I've seen her in solo queue once. So that is a bit curious. What What's your take on uh, Zeri Yumi in this uh, game? I think it's interesting that I even cast a curse the trap where I said those picks aren't going to be played. They're only playing the LCS, but they lock in the Zeri Yumi. <laughs> and I would have been able to flex my big big Anos muscles. We we need because, to stop cursing. Like we, I think we just yeah. need to stop predicting at this point. Cause, yeah, uh... <laughs> absolutely. But when you pick a Yumi and they lock in Janna Vane, the only response is to also pick scaling. Because if you try to play aggressive with a, a Yumi, you could go for an angle like Illusion. But overall, Zeri is a lot more of a, okay, you want to scale? We scale against you. But you know what? I think the Vane pick to like I like to point out is that one of Mordekaiser's greatest counters is the Vane. You can mm -hmm. death roam her, but... It's kind of the opposite. Clone ambulance, clone ambulance, but not for me. Yeah. And he goes in the death realm, dodges out of all his abilities, and has the percent max health crew damage just to shred him completely. So taking away Absolutely. the vein from Ascend at 5 is a great idea, but they do respond in full with Azari, which is a very big, powerful pick on this current patch. At least in terms of high-level play. We have yet to see how effective it is in terms of a gold elo level, a gold plat elo level game. Mm -hmm. So... Mid bands galore as Victor, Yasuo, Adivia, and Lissandra are taken off in the last uh, phase of bands. And one of the safest blind picks available, Orn. However, Orn into a Mordekaiser is one of the worst matchups that he could have. So that is a bit of a curious pick on the side of Ascendant 5. Uh, especially now, especially with a Bane on the side of uh, USF. Orn uh, might not be as tanky in this game as he usually is. So a bit curious there. Yeah, very interesting. Vayne seeming like the a great pick here overall. And, and Sentinel 5 are kind of counterpicking themselves in the Vayne. But we were wrong about the draft last time. We were, yeah. Uh, we had to keep that in mind. We don't <laughs> curse it again, but Cassiopeia locked in here. Interesting, you don't see it often at all. And also a Poppy for the jungle. Mm -hmm. Poppy, a very popular pick into Nazari. Just uh, minimizing those dashes however she can. It's also really good if you can get onto an Orn because both his ultimate and his knockup and his E are are conducted through dashes and they're very telegraphed. So definitely a good pick up there. As we will see what the counter pick is used for. They're hovering Oriana, and it looks like that one will be locked in. So again, just more and more team fighting for the side of Ascendant Five. It worked last time. We'll see what they can do this time around. So looking at these two drafts. Mordekaiser, not as counterpicked as he probably should have been for a first pick. So, um, what do you what do you think in uh, on these drafts right now? Because I, at the same time, we do need to do predictions because mm -hmm. yes, you know it's it's, ki it it's kind of our job. So, looking mm -hmm. at these two drafts, just on a surface level, not not taking the last game into consideration, just you see these two drafts in a game. Who do you think would win? You know, I have to unequivocally say use USF White. And the reason I say that, it might be a little bit unpopular because Ascendant 5 has so many, you know, <laughs> champions. Zeri, <laughs> Yumi, Orn. Timmy's you don't like to see in your games. At the end of the day, I think USF White and Ascendant 5 have this kind of, I, like, Ascendant 5 has completely this idea. We play for 5v5. However, USF White with the Mordekaiser has a unique ability where it can win on the sideline and they can play sidelines if they need to. Plus, their 5v5 is still pretty good, and mostly depend. this 5v5 is mostly dependent on the game state. How much gold do you have to your your opponents? What's your lead on objectives? How can you have good control um, to start out the fights in the right way? It's not really decided purely by the comps, so having a split push options opens you up to more uh, paths that you can take in the mid-game to try to further your lead or claw back a lead. 4v4 and Poppy, you know, they started out uh, B1, B2, B3... N Arguably bad, but I think their B4 and especially their B5 with the Poppy is a great counter pick into all their champions. Absolutely, with the amount of dashes, it can even it can even counter Yumi. Like Yumi's yeah. lock onto a champion is considered a dash. So being able to ground, like they have very a lot of anti mobility with the Cassiopeia, also preventing dashes. Just a lot of counter mobility, so it'll be really hard for this area, I think, to really get off the ground, but. Once 
once she's able to do that, I think it would be really scary for the side of Ascendant 5. However, so just looking at the drafts, definitely a lot of counter uh, pick potential on the USF side. However, now taking in last game into consideration, what is your prediction for who will come up with the victory in game two? A5. <laughs> I know, I know. I said USF White's draft is better, which I think their draft was better in game one. I think it's better in game two. I think it's arguably better in game two, but I think Ascendant 5 have a very clear comp identity, which is really nice. I mean, I said it was great last game, but it's especially great if you are the better team because it prevents you from losing. And I think Ascendant 5, the crucial member that I want to point out here, especially in relation to the comp, is this Oriana. That ball is creates a field of zone, which is very hard for marksmen or ranged uh, control mages to really get through. If she's able to place that in front of her front line and place it in areas where she knows their, the teammates are going to flank, it's crucial in terms of positioning of this ball to basically say, hey, Vayne, you know the ball's here. Try to auto me. Try to mm -hmm. auto my front line. You cannot do that because if you do that, then I ult you and then my entire team one-shots you. The only Absolutely, problem is they yeah. don't really have too much burst damage to follow up on the Oriana ult. Maybe, ooh, dear, you know, I don't know too much about the new uh, about the new rework, but I don't think they have too much burst to really follow that up. But it can definitely be a deterrence uh, from mm -hmm. Bane hitting that front line. Speaking of the Udir rework, for those of you who don't know much about it, it is one of my I think favorite reworks because what I love when Riot does this is when they rework champions but keep the identity. Um, Udir very very similar to his old one but just evolved to the current meta so i think it is a really great we work for the champion but he does do a lot of the same things his e still stuns his r is still aoe um his his q still is uh auto uh auto attack speed buffer that kind of thing but it is more evolved for the current meta however one curious thing that i want to bring up i don't think it's mordecai's or top which I actually think is quite wrong <laughs> on the side of uh, on the side of USF because Mordekaiser into Ord is such a good is such a free lane for the Mordekaiser. So instead, putting the Poppy up there is a bit curious, and I think just less gank potential because I have played Mordekaiser jungle. It is very powerful once you hit level six, but just the early er, your early gank potential is just essentially run at them hope they don't see you coming and that's about it you don't have a gap closer your e especially with mobility is super easy to dodge so i just don't think um putting the mordekaiser in the jungle was the best call for the side of usf but i have also yet to give my prediction and what i am going to say is because i am now 0 and 3 on my predictions so I am instead going to root for A5 because if I am wrong, we get a game three. And if I'm right, I get my first prediction. So mm -hmm. it's kind of it's kind of a more of a strategic pick for me. But mm -hmm. uh and it's a win-win no matter what. So that is uh that is my prediction. I'm going for A5 this time around. Mm -hmm. uh, but in my opinion, I was I was rooting for the USF draft, but just Giving up that free lane that the Mordekaiser can play into the Orn is just a bit curious, but they might have a plan that I am not aware of, so we also have to keep that in mind as well. It might be high IQ, but in reality, it kind of looks like they're they're playing... It's kind of a boneheaded idea, in my opinion, because the Mordekaiser with his E, like you said, hopes for ganks, but Poppy, the Giga Chad of the jungle, literally mm -hmm. walks into your lane, stuns you, can flash stun you, can gap close instantly, and she's very effective, especially against a Zeri, who can't I'm pretty sure, you know, Zeri means in the chat, correct me if I'm wrong, you can't buffer the E over the wall because the stun only lands when you hit the wall. So even mm -hmm. if you E into the wall, she clips you back, which is crucial. But with Mord, with the pullback, Zeri can just wait the pullback and then E over the wall or E over the wall at the start. Same with something like an Orn. He can dash out of that situation before Mord can even pull him back. Poppy can prevent that by Eing and Wing forward. And, you know, maybe it might be effective against an Orianna, but... Eh, Oriana should be fine in the in the mid lane as long as she has flash. So overall, mm -hmm. I think, you know, if I had to go, like, if I could go back, I was not told about this poppy top shenanigans. <laughs> so I would say even in draft wise, Ascendant Five definitely uh, has something going. Okay, on. so we're reverting some of our uh, previous predictions. 
Um, again, one last quick thing before we go to break that I do want to say is there is still the element of comfort, which is so important at this level. Excuse me, sorry about that. It could just be that Dura Lumen is just a bit more comfortable on the Poppy than the Mordekaiser, or perhaps it's a cute shoe lane, and I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing that name, um, who might be a bit more comfortable on Mordekaiser than Poppy. You always got to keep that in mind. However, we do have to go to a quick break for the spectator delay. We will be back with some more League of Legends action in just a moment. Welcome back to the Risen Recap. Today we're looking towards Risen Unstoppable, and the stream started off with a Wait bang, up. quicksand, asleep. It's, it's the first game of Unstoppable Risen pre-made! Come on, get up, come but on, come I on. gotta say, he was smooth once he rolled into it. Wow. And our first series was Big Bongo Boys playing up against Clarity Black. For the first yeah, 20 yeah, minutes of the game, it was a bit of fighting in the top lane, but not much happened besides that. Oh, but the engage coming out from Sejuani, but it's traded back, and Maokai actually regenerated a lot more health than I would have expected there. For a boxer squirrel, just really those kind of impacts making a huge uh, difference in the gold. Yeah, and I don't know whether I want to call them Triple B, BBB, or Big Bongo Boys, because they're all, actually they're not all same song. Big Bongo. Then there was a mega turnaround fight for the Big Bongo Boys after they made a Big Dragon attempt, but then they got challenged again for the Dragon attempt, which Big Bongo Big Bongo now, Boys won the two, fight for Boys. On this side, and there's a 3 on the other side, but I can't cut to it, and I can't cut to it. But Boxer Crow in the midst of all, unable to get too much out, but finds the Q before he's last dies, and Chicken Fried Rice to his team with good depth, does not unfortunately have the W enough up to heal him, and the call comes back in the circuit, but finds one, can she find two? No, she gets shut down, and the exchange of lives is so insane, can Maokai find the damage to will back, and he does, but unfortunately, it is the ace on the side of CLB that allows them to get this dragon. Much later in the game, Big Bongo Boys chased Akali down in the bot lane, meaning that Clarity Black had so much freedom to take that first Baron, and from that Baron, they spiraled away from a team fight. Welcome and welcome back. We got game two between USF White and Ascendant 5. Another bush stack here, but it doesn't look like we'll have the same level one shenanigans from game one. That is a bit disappointing for me. But uh, just a five point here for Ascendant 5 as we get set for this game. So, yeah. going into this, uh, we, have, we have a bit of a respect in the chat. I appreciate that. We have the good luck. Have fun. <laughs> Um, but going into this game, uh, we did talk about our predictions and everything like that, but if you are the side of, um, uh, USF White, who we have both predicted to lose this game, what do you think is the one way that they could prove us wrong? Like, where is their WidCon? You have to think it would be the vein, but do you perhaps lean more to a Cassi Cassiopeia, who is more of a mobility limiter? Like, what would be your, uh, call on this? I'm an 80 carry man. Simple oh. as that. And uh, as an 80 carry main, I have a fat ego. So I shouldn't have asked. You shouldn't have asked. So it's obviously going to be the vein here. And especially with something like an Ornn and Udyr, you do have access to shredding and one-shredding the front line. And I think Vayne and Tazeri is a really good matchup. You can dodge out of the Qs in terms of the late game to prevent her from stacking too much. Um, if you get on top of her, you have so much burst damage. You can clean up the Yumi afterwards. You can dodge the Orina ball. Um, if you play outside of a range... You can, you can uh, in terms of the shockwave, if you react to it in time, you can ulti Q out. Or even if you are getting shockwave, then you're getting hit in, you can ulti Q to get the invis. Vayne has so much counterplay into this team that it's really up to whether or not she plays the game well. We'll decide whether USF wins. So a bit of a curious start then for both of these junglers who, when it looks like their botliner should be the main carries, both of them are full clearing up towards topside. So a bit of a curious start, maybe not playing towards their win conditions quite yet, and both of them just opting in for a full clear at this point. Uh, it looks like Imaginary Champ is just a bit uh, more ahead of his counterpart, that makes sense. The AoE clear of Udyr is just a bit faster than the AoE clear of Mordekaiser. So we will see what each are able to do, as the two burly boys in top lane are just whacking each other with their various hammers as uh, you expect this kind of matchup to go. And Poppy, definitely getting the level lead. But one thing I want to point out about that statement you said earlier about the junglers, both tapping topside despite their bot lanes really trying to uh, play to scale and also play to get a lead over each other because they're both the win cons. Mordekaiser, I don't think it's a bad decision to path topside because Zeri, uh, Vayne, uh, 
Vayne Janus should always have the push versus a Zeri Yumi lane. And because of that, you definitely see a lot of things going on, but some action hey, on the top we, side. We, we got our Scuttle fight now. Imaginary Champ is trying to go onto the Mordekaiser, who is a level up, but Mint rotates faster. There's the Flash, but first blood from the red buff will get the Mordekaiser down first. Mint is in trouble now. Cheese will pick up that kill. Imaginary Champ is running away, but he tries to turn oh, back into the fight, the and it is a double kill picked up for Cheese. So USF White, they lose the first blood, but they will get two kills in return. And a great play coming out from USF. They obtain those two kills, like you said. And they re they knew their comp wins those early games 3v3s. And that's what I was saying earlier. They want to play towards this top side because they know Janna will have the push. And they know they win the top side fights if Imaginary Champ goes up for that. And Imaginary Champ, I think it was a lot better decision to path towards this bot side and sort of avoid this Mordekaiser because he is so powerful at fighting. Absolutely. But again, you have to... You have to see that Imaginary Champ did not finish his full clear. So a level down over Q Chi Lane for that scuttle fight just puts him at such a disadvantage. He does pick up the first blood, barely with the red buff uh, burn that just managed to kill the enemy jungler. But other than that, that is just a, a pretty rough start here for uh, Ascendant 5. But we'll see if they are able to recover. But two kills onto a tank killer like Cheese, that is, uh, that is pretty rough. And what most to point out is that the gold lead is 300 in favor of the USF. And that fight went pretty well, but you would expect a little bit more, especially with two, like, two, like, four assists worth of gold and two kills worth of gold. But that's mainly because, oh, uh, wait, what was it? Oh, my God. Hold up. Sorry. I just lagged <laughs> out IRL for a second. My bad. But the, C <laughs> the CS yeah, difference from so Mordekaiser <laughs> in the Udir, and the CS is kind of kept even not slightly in the favor of USF just yet, but they're clawing their way back. Uh, Prince is outsacing the Sane, which can be crucial, especially since he picked the Cole. Is the decision you want to take on the Zeri if you want to play towards... Like, if you know that nothing's going to happen bot lane, that's what you buy. You get a little mm -hmm. bit of extra... Uh, uh, you get one extra gold pure minion kill, so it generates 100 gold, and you can sell it for 180 after the fact. So it is a very useful item for generating gold, and I think it's a great decision here. Absolutely, like, um, Call is definitely a powerful item if you are looking to hit those item power spikes a bit faster and don't need the uh, lane uh, priority. That comes with Doran's Blade or wh whatever other starting item that you would prefer. But um, compared to last game, uh, this is definitely a bit more of a slower start for each of these teams. You know, we didn't have nine kills before the minion spawned like last time, so a bit of a different start for both these teams. Oh, but we have a little bit of action here in the top lane. There comes the flash, plus the ult from Astral Hailstorm. Does manage to get the knockup onto Duralubin, but with the flash away and the shield cannot c collect the final blow here. We also have some action here in the bot lane. His imaginary champ might be looking for a dive here onto Lucas, but the wave is just not in a place to do it. Yep, they don't have the crash, so there is no game here. But she's trying to look for something topside as well. Uh, yeah, the roam up to the top late Astral Hailstorm just has to run all the way to his second turret. But he was able to chuck out Dura Lumen well enough that they aren't able to push that wave in. So it looks like both of these top laners are going to lose out on the CS instead of just one. So actually, I'd say that it is a win here for Astral Hailstorm. Yep, uh, Imaginary Champion tried to make a play bot side because of the stuff that... He saw happening to his boy in the There we go, CC immune. Who dear manages to get the stun onto the Cha Cha, who is burning down. They will get the kill. Kuchu laid a box mint into the death realm, but mint is now running in the opposite direction from his team. The ultimate from Cheese doesn't really get anyone, but Kuchu laid will be able to get the kill onto mint. But the boys are back, and three is greater than one. Cheese has to just run away, but he is just running to an early grave. That is two kills picked up on the side of uh, of Sended Five. Well played by them. And you know the the very short skirmishes, the one v ones. We see USF doing their thing, going even, and sometimes coming out on top. But it is these three v three, four v four fights that A Five are just dominating on. The team fighting prowess that we have seen is definitely more A5 favored. They are just performing how they need to in order to win these team fights. However, with the dragon buffs, this is burning down very slowly, and the juggler is able to fully respawn and might actually get a smite off here. 
This is going to be close. Uh, neither one of them has an upgraded spike. It has to go down to 450 before something can happen. The fight is there, that. and it is stolen by the Mordekaiser. Well done by him, and the fight turns completely in the wrong direction for A5. We have to stop caster cursing. <laughs> yes, absolutely. And the thing is about... And I think what I like to point out oftentimes when I talk about dragons and going from them early is that in a lot of other regions, you see 10 minutes, sometimes 11 minutes, even pushing a 15 minute dra first dragons being taken. And the reason for that is the respawn times are so low. Even if you can win a dragon fight, they can come back and potentially get on it. And that is further um, exacerbated by the fact that dragons have so much more HP now. It's it's something that's been in the game for a while, but something that has shifted the meta slowly and slowly to the point where people say, hey, dragons, not very useful in the early game. We'd rather go play for the Rift Heralds, which did just spawn uh, about a minute ago. Let's see which teams play towards it. As a Belveth main, I uh, ignore dragons completely. So <laughs> I am more of a Rift Herald taker, but um, definitely like... For the enemy juggler to be able to spawn and just run back to the dragon and steal it is just, uh, that has got to hurt for the side of A5. We'll see if they're able to recover from here. Um, so, first dragon going over to the side of USF White. Um, looks like we might have some action here in top lane, but unfortunately spotted on a ward, Imaginary Champ has to back off as Cheese has roamed up as well. Looking like Cheese is starting up the rift here, but we see a fight on top side. Here we, here we go. We got the ultimate coming in from the Udir, and now here comes the stun as well. The ultimate from Cheese doesn't really get anyone. An imaginary champ is able to get the kill, but he is not done. He is going in onto Cheese. The ultimate from Mint is almost perfect, and Astro Hailstorm is able to pick up that second kill. So, grabbing not one, but two kills on a top lane gig. That should be Ding Dong, a free Rift Herald for the side, but we are not done. As now the ultimate from Dead Candle, Lucas is forced to flash away. Prince is trying to go for a bit more, but unable to get it. So getting a flash out from the ADC in the bot lane as well. Mm -hmm. They gained so much on the top side, and especially they played the fight very well. They had the numbers and they utilized to advantage, but uh, Herald Brawl. another steal! Um, the fight is still going on. Imaginary Champ is able to run away, but Mint is locked into the death zone. His friends are running away. I just don't see a way out for him here. Q Chulain picks up yet another kill and another objective where all he had to do was just walk up and press smite. Just GG, like... thanks for the leash, boys. I can't... They can't keep getting away with it. We keep Caster Chris again. We said this morning, Kaiser's dog water. He's popping off. <laughs> it's insane in this top side, uh, but this game overall, pointing out the play beforehand and leading to that Rift Herald, it was the side of Daryl Omen and his squad who was struggling. They got two members taken down and they were able to take out the Herald, but crucially on the bot side, if you'll notice, the Janna rotated up to help the team, but as soon as Zeri and Yumi saw that, you could see them immediately go for that aggressive play. They popped the Lost Chapter, they popped... The uh, lightning crash. They want to get that kill, but the mini wave just barely spawned and let Vayne live. But she had to burn her flash in the end of it. Yeah, unfortunately, losing your flash on ADC is usually pretty rough. A lot of mobility for Lucas, though, on this Vayne. So hopefully he will be able to keep himself alive for the next team fight. Um, however, with uh, Dragon spawning in uh, just over a minute here, um, not going to have a flash available for that fight. Almost all flashes actually on the side of USF White are down. So you have to wonder, will they even go for this fight here at the Dragon? Just at a huge summoner disadvantage. Mm -hmm. It can be very rough to try to go for these. But I don't think that's really take it, being taken as a So No offense to any Platinum players out there. But <laughs> sometimes at a certain point, it's, and once you get to the higher, higher level, you, you start to really focus on... Hey, we don't. Can we do this without flash? Rather, rather than can we do this with numbers or can we do this with X items? It is those summoners that are so crucial to winning fights. And without a flash on Vayne, it can be very rough to play. But as a plat player, I'm taking offense to that. But I'm a plat you player. are 100% correct. <laughs> I'm I'm a plat player too, and that's exactly why I know that to be the case. Uh, it's not really taken into consideration. But as we talked about the win cons in the early game uh, earlier. This vein and this Zeri, and the Zeri is definitely coming out of top. 20 CS lead, a kill lead. But this Mordekaiser has become sort of the new win con here. Uh, unfortunately, 
What's interesting about Mordekaiser... Oh, we might have some little bit of an action here, but they just have to find out. What's interesting about Mordekaiser is that the two ways to kind of beat Death Realm without buying QSS is to either beat him in Death Realm or outrange him or make it so he can't get close enough in range for him to Death Realm. And Zeri is exact. It's really, really effective at doing that. We see potential course, fight yes. happening over the dragon. Just a little bit of poke. So a second dragon picked up for the side of USF White. Uh, well done by them. They are... They have 100% objective control. Oh, and it looks like we have another fight here as Imaginary Champ is locked in the Death Realm. Mint is making the walk over, but he might not have a juggler to save. QQ Lane, another solo kill. He is two levels ahead of his adversary, and he just puts him into the Death Realm and deletes him from Summoner's Rift. We are not done. QQ Lane is now going after Mint. Mint is going to have to run Wait, away to, to his turret and just the big hammer comes down and chunks out Mint so hard. Q Chulain is just taking over this game right now. Yeah, he's really just flopping his big hammer around Summoner's Rift, doing a really great job at just deleting these enemy champions. He's got so much gold in his pocket compared to the, his jungle opponent. I know you po pointed out Ivern last game, the CS lead not being too much. But in this game, the CS, uh, the CS lead being big was not very a big factor, but in this game, it certainly looks like it is and is going to continue to be. Yes, on a farming jungler like Udyr, falling this far behind in CS is not where you want to be. He is now still two levels down, actually. I saw the saw the Mordekaiser level up, but uh, Imaginary Chap is uh, level eight now as well. But still two levels down on a farming jungler is just so rough for the Udyr. And definitely, we're going to have to see Imaginary Champ... Uh, uh, really start to switch on the AFK farming route if we really want to see him get back into this game. And when you're most fed members, the tank it does cause a little bit of concern if you are an A5 fan, but if you are one of those people said it earlier, a fan of this team, you have to put your hope into Zeri, into Prince with two eyes. He's got the ghost and the flash, and he's got the swagger to try to take out the enemy team solo with Zeri, with potentially Yumi, the cat on his back. You know, I like to call, you know, Zeri when she first launched. You know, Twitch is a rat, of course, but Zeri is sort of a rat. She scurries, she skimpers, she gets right out from under your nose, so it is sort of a cat in the rat situation. So, so I was about to say, we, we, we still have Tom and Jerry, just in a in a, in a weird way, that's all. Yeah, and, and, and it's definitely a different form. Uh, uh, Jerry's looking a little bit a little bit quirky <laughs> right now. Yeah, exactly. And so, if you want to put your hope into one member, it would be Prince. And, and, and when did we give Jerry a gun? Like, what, what did that happen? Yeah, <laughs> did we give it a gun that, like, shoots all oh, the time? Here's flash the flash forward realm. from Q2 Lane. Prince is trapped in the death realm. Yumi has to find a new host, but Prince, with two eyes, is just deleted. The flash ult from Q2 Lane just deletes the enemy AD carry. All right. I think I'm going to limit myself to one caster curse per game. Okay. Uh, I think we've already hit game. the limit on this one, my uh, friend. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I believe you said earlier the only person who has a chance of beating him in the death realm is the Zeri with that mobility. But once it actually happens in practice, uh, fortunately, I, I, uh, yeah. we, we lost Jerry to uh, to another man with a yeah. hammer. So. Unfortunately, I, uh, I meant more so that like Zeri can outrange Mordekaiser in like, Mordekaiser can't get in range to death realm, but you know, a flash definitely changes things. <laughs> that is correct. Flash is a uh, it's beautiful like that, isn't it? Mm -hmm. All of a sudden, uh, far away ADCs become very close. But Prince, interestingly enough, doesn't opt to use the flash in the death round, which I think he he could have gone for that. He could have opted to use that to dodge maybe dodge maybe one more ability tank a little bit less damage, and potentially survive that. But decides to opt to save it, potentially for this next team fight and the Rift Herald. It's currently being taken down from Cha Cha Chu Lane. Cha Chu Lane. Ch wait, it's Ku Chu Lane. Ku Chu Lane. Perfect. All right, Kuchu I got it now. Ku Chu Lane. Ku Chu Lane. Okay. All right, uh, we got it. We got it already because he's probably gonna be the one that we're gonna talk about the most. Yeah, I, I, we, have, we definitely have to talk about him this game. Five, two, and three on the Mordekaiser. The current highest level in the game. Actually, I am trolling. Orn is the highest level in the game, but the highest level on his team. Still two levels up over his adversary and a 700 gold bounty on this Mordekaiser. But is anyone going to be able to collect it is the real question. Yeah, good question indeed. But A5, you know, most teams that are behind, want, and especially when you're behind to the level of objective bounties, you're down 
around 3k golds. You have to look to make crazy plays to make comebacks, but A5 opting to slow the game down to a snail's pace. They know they win in the scaling. So why would they fight in the first place? But as I say that, they are shutting me the hell up and they want to fight this dragon. Here we go. Dragon is spawning. Rift Herald has been summoned in the top lane. Uh, Dura Lumen is coming down to help his team with this fight. So far, just a vision, vision fight as of right now. But we're looking for the engage here pretty soon. Here comes the Orn Horn. Who is he going to get? Unfortunately, Astrid Hailstorm is not going to be able to corrupt anyone with the Orn Horn. Gyuchu Lane has Mint trapped in the Death Realm. Here comes the rest of his key team. Gyuchu Lane is now unstoppable. The Yumi is not going to be able to get anyone with that There is ultimate. On and they are just getting decimated on the side of A5. Prince has to dash away. But the dragon is now going over to the side of you. Still stacking. Can he find the the flash from Yukus is responding with the flash of Prince. But I don't think Prince is going to be able to do anything. Uh, he might this. just be leading Tom and Jerry to an early grade. The flash from Dura Lumen is able to pick off Prince. Another objective gained for the side of USF White and the ace as well. Uh, they wanted to go for broke there, even in. A t the face of a 2v5 situation, Prince opts to g fly close to the sun and gets burned up by it. Uh, the Janna Tornado really clutched there. I think, if I'm going to be quite frank here, if Prince plays that maybe a little bit better, kites it a little bit better, I think they have the potential to win that because of how high skill selling this champion is. If you have correct movement, if you have great spacing and zoning uh, and spacing master rage with your Qs and stacking it up, Zeri can take over fight even 2v5 like that with something like a human attack. But when you are playing in such a high pressure situation, like a regular season game, and you are the last man standing and everyone's watching you, including the enemy team, and the th thousands, even millions of viewers at home are watching your every <laughs> single move, it gets really stressful. And I've been in those situations like that before, and it's kind of hard to recover from. Oh, imaginary champ, this is not the place you want to be as he is locked once again in the death realm. It's almost a second home for him at this point. And Q2 Lane will just wipe him off the bat. Astral Hailstorm, however, will grab the solo queue against Cheese. I wonder how the heck that happened. As a tank killer, like, Cheese should not really be losing that fight. But well played by Astral Hailstorm to get some gold back onto his own side. But with the jungler down, that just needs a Baron for the side of USF. And they're putting priority on this Baron like they should. Baron is the win con to end the game. In the last game uh, that they had, Baron respawned and they were sort of, it wasn't completely even, but it was sort of the level where the teams could play at an even level. Baron becomes a really cool, ob uh, crucial objective, but we see them trying to they, cut off my thoughts. They here are aware this is happening, but the, no smite. The Baron is easily picked up. The teleport in from Dura Lumen will take out Astral Hailstorm. So not only do they not contest the Baron, they will lose their beefy boy in the horde as well. We talk about the scaling constantly because it is just the main factor of this game. And so getting an early Baron to close it out is crucial. Can they end on this Baron or will they have to wait 5 minutes and 30 seconds for the next one to spawn? And that could be the time that Prince needs to scale up and potentially carry his team. You see him pick up the QSS, is scared of this Mordekaiser Death Realm, knows he can't win in it anymore. Hell, I'm scared of this uh, Mordekaiser Death Realm at this point. He is just slaughtering anyone who comes across his path so picking up the qss very important here for the main carry of ascendant five uh la cha cha gets a free tornado onto imaginary champ but now with the baron pushing in multiple lanes uh this is just so difficult for ascendant five to do anything and it's interesting. They get back on the map a little bit late, USF. But it looks like they're going to go for a 1-3-1 one, one sort of style. And I think that's a really great idea. You can't really contest a Mordekaiser on the split push. And the Poppy versus Orn is a pretty even fight. So you're able to put those minions close to the tower. You're able to get the Siege. And your mid lane, you have a Cassio. You have Lucas. And you have Lachacha. The only issue I can see with potentially going for this 1-3-1 one, one is that you have no front line in the mid lane. But you have A5 who does have access to the front line. Uh, poor mid, who, who, whose decision was it to put mid up against this, uh, monster of a champion right now as he's just getting poked under tower, but here we go, imaginary champion is trying to get the sun onto Dura Lumen. He is slowed by the Phoenix Storm, but unfortunately the damage is just not quite there for imaginary champ. 
but in the bot lane, Q too late is now legendary. But here we go, there's another fight in the top lane. Astro Hailstorm is not able to get the ultimate off. Lachacha has to run away. The ultimate from Cheese will not get anyone. Lucas will slay Imaginary Champ and will be able to make his escape. Prince is chasing a little bit, but will not get anything out of it. It is now a 10,000 gold lead for the side of USF White. And Q2 Lane is just knocking on their front door right now. Yeah. USF really knowing how to play the game properly wants to split up the enemy teams so they can win these fights. But even though the fight was their main member, they got the Mordecai's in the 9, 2, and 5 god. Even though he was boss side for that entire fight, his team was still so far ahead uh, besides him that they were able to just solidly win that top side fight. This area, you can notice towards the back half of the fight, was dealing zero damage, and that's got to make you nervous if you are an A5 fan. Absolutely. This is now so scary for the side of A5 as Imaginary Champ is not even able to get his own camps. You're four levels down. You're unable to do anything about this, but uh, uh, Q -Q -Q Lane, sorry, um, is now trapping Imaginary Champ. He will get the kill here. I believe no one's in the death zone at this point, but he will yep. get the double kill. Dank Candle will be going down as well. Prince with two eyes. Unable to get anywhere. Future Lane is actually it's dropping okay. dangerously low. The shutdown will go over to Mint as finally the big bad boy of the Rift will go down. And that could have actually been an insane team white from the side of USF. But if you'll notice at the start of the fight, actually Mordekaiser's Death Realm gets cancelled by the CC Moon Udir. Uh, he tried to use it on him, but he was CC immune, so he couldn't put him in the Death Realm. There's some interactions like that in the game. But it came out crucially in that fight because Mordekaiser... If he was able to lock down that lone member of the Zeri at the end of it, no shockwave would have come out and the shutdown would not have been given. So stuff like that can really snowball and turn a fight in terms of the later half of it. Now, three items on this Mordecai Zeri is he's picked up Riftmaker, uh, Rylize, and Demonic Embrace. He is just an absolute unit. You get caught by any one of your, his abilities, you will be slowed and just deleted from the map. Imaginary Champ is not even able to get his own camps against the enemy top later, who's bullying him off of his own camps. Oh, as, as a jungler, this is not, this is barely even Imaginary Champ's fault. There's just nothing he can do about it. And Yusuf trying to look to close it out here. Next Baron spawning in one minute and 20 seconds. They do not want to take this Elder, I would naturally assume, because Elder is a little bit of a coin flip at certain points. But Imaginary Champ does not have access to a flash, which is kind of crucial for steals. You need to have that flash if you want to go for an over-the-wall play, or else you just need to win the fight so you don't have to flash in the pit. And he also doesn't have any mobility over the walls. So a steal angle on the Elder is not looking too great, or a steal angle on the Baron. So they could just wait for the Elder to close it out, but I think they're pretty confident they close it out with the Baron. Absolutely. Um, with the Dragon... Uh now taken that is a mountain soul oh man this this mordekaiser just seemingly becomes more and more unkillable as the game goes on as he's now picked up the cosmic drive just oh my goodness he is now flame horizon his uh opposing jungler well over 100 cs lead for him and oh my goodness you poor poor man imaginary champ is just Solo ulted by Cheese. Just all the one, all the man wants to do is just farm his Raptors, and he's not able to do that. And Imaginary Champ getting sent completely out of reality there. Not having a fun time in this game, as you said, the Flame Horizon. But I want to point out as they're ending the game. Oh, the Death Realm Unstoppable. Another one of those interactions. Uh, yeah, the Unstoppable Ord does not get put into the Death Realm, so a bit of a waste of it out there from Cutie Lane, but. I mean, uh, at this point, you can give him a few mistakes, and I still think he will be able to solo carry this game, so not too concerned about that right now. Mm, they blast coming over, and they're looking to take the Baron right here and right now, and it doesn't look like A5 has any way to contest. Their jungler was not even up until about 15 seconds ago, and they have too much burst damage. They're, no one is even close to it. That is now, I believe, a 14,000 gold lead. Oh my goodness, that is just, um, it's getting a bit too brutal right now, as, uh, USF is just toying with the enemies at this point, like, 
they're they're still pulling out like brush cheeses as a uh, imaginary ch uh, champ just tries to go to farm his camps and he's just not able to do that it's almost as though if you leave your base you're just subject to get deleted by anyone on the opposing team now there are two schools of thought and why they can't really end the game one of them is because they're choosing not to specifically for mental damage which is the style of play i like to think about the most um <laughs> Is that E.T. in the LCS? It's all mental game here. It is really all mental game, and look no further than a team in the LCS like E.T. who opts to, and sometimes in a lot of games they opt to do a little bit of trolling, as one would say, and they like to go for these sort of extending the game out, em emoting, taunting their opponents, but the emotes aren't really coming out as a fight ensues in the top side. Finally, uh, Q2 Lane is able to get an ultimate onto an opposing enemy team, but the Zonias will save Mid's life. Here comes Imaginary Champ. Will he get the revenge the on his enemy jungler? It takes four members to take him out, but in the meantime, their base is just absolutely crumbled. Here comes the rest of the squad to back up Astro Hailstorm. Chief Strait again, Alfred is not able to get anyone. Dura Lumen will send Zeri and Dank Candle back to the fountain. They are able to pick up two inhibitors as well as a Nexus turret in exchange for their juggler's life. And really, the play there is so obvious, and I'm glad that they went for it. USF, they send their strongest member topside, and that puts in the mind of A5s, hey, if we can take out this Mordekaiser, so we can have a way to come back in the game. But because Mordekaiser was shut down so recently, you don't really get too much gold from killing him, so you can't really try to funnel that into a Zeri. And also, you're able to, while they throw a bunch of members up there, just take their base in the meantime. Really great macro coming out from USF, making sure that they keep this game as solid and as steady as possible, as they got to keep it steady, especially for something as coin flippy as an Elder can be in the late game. Uh, Elder is spawning in less than a minute now. Two inhibitors down on the side of Ascendant 5. One Nexus turret down. To be completely honest, I actually think Q2 Lane could just walk into the enemy base to take the turret without any minions, and I think he'd be fine. But it looks like they're more opted into the safer bet, which is the Elder Dragon. They are going to be able to get tons of uh, vision and walk. It almost seems like that uh, A5 would just be walking into a trap here. Duralumen goes in on mint, but uh, just walks out, able to take a couple tower shots. What I crucially want to point out is that a lot of other teams would say, ah, we have Baron, let's just go for the Elder. Let's just sit on top of the Elder. But USF making, doing a good job. Oh, we see a fight here we go. In the bottom lane, the Ornhorn will not be found as he is now put into the death row. Q2 lane is now just decimated Astro Hailstorm, and he will go down. Lucas trying to make something happen. Q2 lane is not slain. Imaginary champ Prince is the last man standing but he will not be able to get away. Dank Candle, who was standing on his shoulders, will drop as well. Dura Lumen trying to take out Mint, as there was a 1v1 at the top lane, but Mint is able to take him out. But the base is just absolutely gone. It looks like this will be the end here. Kyuchu Lang, bring down the hammer, as he will be able to solo carry this game. Looks like there's going to be a fountain dive. Kyuchu Lang just kind of a couple of them just walk into the fountain, uh, maybe pad the stats a bit a little bit, but the game will still end. This series is tied. Predictions be damned. USF tie <laughs> up this series. They look to precarious some, some, some momentum into game three here. Uh, really solidly played overall. That is now, oh, I'm 0-4 on my predictions. That is, uh... I think I'm like, I think I'm two and two or one and three not that much better to be honest i mean oh that it's better than oh and four you look at that zero percent win rate and you're oh that is not good so let's uh analyze that game a little bit the mordekaiser q2 lane the jungler i will remind you twenty nine thousand, almost thirty thousand damage this game as he finishes with twenty nine thousand nine hundred and fifteen. the next highest member on his team was actually uh, Cassiopeia Cheese in the mid lane with 17,961. Just out damaging everyone on his team by 10,000 damage. I think the MVP is a very clear front runner here. Not only that, steals the first dragon by just walking into the pit and smiting it, steals the first Rift Herald by walking into the pit and smiting it, and full objective control for the side of 
USF. Just unpack that for a second. Like, what went wrong here for uh, Ascendant 5? I think they didn't stick to the plan. And the plan was we scale. But then the plan in the early game said, hey, let's go take this dragon. And then the plan, you know, the secondary plan was like, hey, we, we got the kills. We won the fight. Now let's take the dragon. And guess who showed up and sold the dragon? That Mordekaiser right then and there. They were doing really well in the early game. But I think it was just little things they didn't clean up. If they could have maybe cleaned up that fight faster or backed up earlier um, so and didn't overchase like they sort of did in that fight. Or they could have maybe tried to burst down the dragon faster, maybe send more members down there to try to get something to happen. But because of that, they were able to flip it and take the dragon. And this did not happen, but not one, but twice. They took out um, a ton of members in the top side, the Jaina trying to defend the tower solo afterwards. But because they took so long pushing in that tower and taking the Rift Herald, you just saw usf just show up and beat them again at another objective and then that was the true nail in the coffin that allowed them to play aggressive in the early game and to piggyback off that point you can have an early lead but against the scaling comp it can be very hard to maintain it but i like how usf approached the mid game mm -hmm. what a lot of teams do with these objective controls is that they will go on the they will say okay the dragon's most important thing we're willing to sacrifice side lanes. We're willing to sacrifice some gold in order to keep this dragon stacking. But USF, you saw in sort of the late game, is that they were not afraid to push out lanes and make sure that they are not losing anything and get the most bang for their buck in terms of the objective at all times. Which means they, they know how to play good League of Legends even when under a pressure-filled situation when they're down 0-1. Absolutely. Um, this has been a battle of the junglers, no doubt. Imaginary champ on the hecker of last game absolutely carried that game as well as he could this time it's kuchu lane with i believe that is a 76 percent uh kill participation as he was able to clutch 19 of the 25 kills on his squad my math might be a bit off there i am not a math major so uh whatever but um just an absolute jungle diff swung either both ways in this one i really do feel for imaginary champ in this one not only were was the enemy juggler taking his camps, like he, he was bullied off by like the enemy top laner, and just it was so hard for him to make any impact in this game. He definitely has my sympathy because I have been there. It has happened to us all. So uh, we are just going to step away for a, a few moments as we are just going to take a quick break, uh, let both the teams kind of recuperate and discuss what their drafts are as we are going to a game three this week, which I'm very excited about. We will be right back with some more League of Legends actions for you all in just a moment. Welcome back to the Risen Recap. Today we're looking towards Risen Unstoppable and the stream started off with a Wait, bang, no. quicksand, a sleep. It's, it's the first game of Unstoppable Risen pre-made. Come on, get up, come but on, come I on. gotta say, he was smooth once he rolled into it. Wow. And our first series was Big Bongo Boys playing up against Clarity. Black for the first yeah, 20 yeah, minutes of the game. It was a bit of fighting in the top lane, but not much happened besides that. Oh, but the engage coming out from Sejuani, but it's trading back. And Maokai actually regenerated a lot more health than I would expect it there. For Boxer Squirrel, just really those kind of impacts making a huge uh, difference in the gold. Yeah, and I don't know whether I want to call them Triple B, BBB, or Big Bongo Boys, because they're all, actually they're not all same song. Big Bongo. Then there was a mega turnaround fight for the Big Bongo boys after they made a big dragon attempt, but then they got challenged again for the dragon attempt, which Big Bongo Big Bongo boys won the fight for the boys. On this side, and there's a 3-3 on the other side, but I can't cut to it, and I can't cut to it. But Boxer Crow in the midst of all, unable to get too much out, but finds the Q before he's last dies and chicken fried rice to his team with good death does not unfortunately have the w enough up to heal him and they call comes back in the circuit but finds one can she find two no she gets shut down and the exchange of lives is so insane can maokai find the damage tree will back and he does but unfortunately it is the ace on the side of clb that allows them to get this dragon much later in the game big bongo boys chased akali down in the bot lane meaning that clarity black had so much freedom to take that first baron and from that baron they spiraled away from a team fight and took the victory the higher ranked uh, Clarity Black and uh, honestly still performing Akali. extremely well. Oh, and she can't get out simply, tries to ulti over the wall, but that's crucial. Four members sent down. This is the freest Baron I've seen and incredibly hard to siege anything. As we're talking about that, the dragon does in fact fall. 
This will be a very important fight. Dragon Soul on the line. Let's see. This is so easy. And the onslaught of shadows into all of the members. We talk about Wombo on one side. We talk about Wombo on the other side. But the whole time is not correctly pinned on enough members to make it worth it and to make it so they can make this comeback. And unfortunately, at the end, CLB take the they don't. and they look to take the game. And then as we rolled into game two, Maokai was picked again. Welcome to the League of Legends Champion Spotlight, featuring Maokai, the Twisted Triant. Maokai is a support tank hybrid. That's why he's the GOAT! The GOAT! Bold move. Overall, Normally Darius is only reserved for those uh, counter picks, and it looks like they're just going to respond with Maokai. And the team was entirely green, so they kind of had the aesthetic advantage for the big bongo boys. For the first 22 minutes, I kind of got distracted watching the LCS. 100 Thieves did win, to a big surprise of all the casters. And then we moved back into the game, where Baron and Swordpoint were both hit here by CLB. Towards this dragon, uh, we do have good depth running up from base. Let's see if we can get here in time. And this dragon is down to 9k HP. They opt to pull it out, so the potential steal is a lot has a lot less potential to happen. The Maokai ulti for the engage. They want to make this happen. The Wombo combo. But the bullet time is just barely out of range. But it's not going to matter in the end. The death ball comes too strong. But this Twitch is free firing in the back line. Good death trying to stall time for his AD carry. But in a 1v4 when you're already routed and they're already on top of you. They make it look easy. With CLB taking a massive victory in the second game. And this series. It seemed like the casters had gone to Hogwarts. Because every single time they were casting and made predictions. They just put a caster curse down on Poor big and bongo the boys. series is taken by Clarity Black. And that was Risen Unstoppable for the night. Hey everybody and welcome back to the Risen Recap. Today we're looking towards Risen Unstoppable and the stream started off with a Wake bang, up. quicksand, asleep. It's, it's the first game of Unstoppable Risen pre-made. Come on, get up, come but on, come I gotta on. say, he was Go. smooth once he rolled into it. Wow. And our first series was big bongo boys playing up against Clarity Black. For the first 20 yeah, minutes of the game, it was a bit of fighting in the top lane, but not much happened besides that. Oh, but the engage coming out from Sejuani, but it's traded back, and Maokai actually regenerated a lot more health than I would have expected there. For Boxer Squirrel, just really, those kind of impacts making a huge uh, difference in the gold. Yeah, and I don't know whether I want to call them Triple B, BBB, or Big Bongo Boys, because they're all, actually, they're not all same solo. Big, big Bongo then there was a mega turnaround fight for the big bongo boys after they made a big dragon attempt but then they got challenged again for the dragon attempt which big bongo big bongo boys won the fight towards on this side and there's a three on the other side but i can't punch it and i can't cut to it but box of in the midst of all unable to get too much out but finds the queue before he's last dies and chicken fried rice to an escape with good depth does not unfortunately have the w enough up to heal him and the call comes back in the circuit but finds one can she find two no she gets shut down and the exchange of lives is so insane can maokai find the damage to treble back and he does but unfortunately it is the ace on the side of clb that allows them to get this dragon much later in the game big bongo boys chased akali down in the bot lane meaning that clarity black had so much freedom to take that first baron and from that baron they spiraled away from a team fight and took the victory the higher ranked uh, clarity black and uh, honestly still performing Akali. extremely well oh and she can't get out simply tries to ulti over the wall but that's crucial. Four members sent down. This is the freest Baron I've seen. And it's incredibly hard to siege anything. As we're talking about that, the dragon does in fact fall. This will be a very important... Hello, everyone. Welcome back. We got Game 3 action coming at you between USF White and Ascendant 5. Uh, we are just waiting on uh, both teams to ready up for the draft. So while we wait, Slatty... It is, so far, blue side, 100% win rate. What do you think going in now that Ascendant 5 has swapped back to the blue side should be the game plan here in order for them to close out this series? I think they picked scaling second game and they saw that it didn't work and they needed a little bit more early aggression. I think what you really need to diagnose um, is you need a, probably a better jungler, at least brawler, because that's kind of where the fights turn sour. I think they also need to focus on if they're going to run a Zara Yumi bot lane, they need to have more damage than a dragon take. Because if they have an Udir and a Zeri and a Yumi taking the dragon, that's going to be a long time before they can eventually get it down to 900 to spite it. And that's crucially kind of how USF Fight were able to win the game because they were able to get the objective back in time. Not only because the dragon HP is more, but because they shred the dragon so little. So I think their adjustment either needs to be a more damaging in the early game jungler, 
less of a tank or their bot lane needs to do more damage or they don't go for objectives in general those are the three options they can really go for and i think they should try to fix those more so in the draft than in the game plan absolutely so de definitely looking uh for those kind of uh for that from ascendant five how about on the side of usf white who are going back to the red side um i am assuming they're going to be banning out the hecarim on red side right here but if not that is definitely a, a jungler that you can put imaginary champ back on and what do you think usf white has to accomplish in order for them to pull out this game because they have not yet no one has yet won on the red side yeah, it's a, it's a very tall task to overcome. And a 100% win rate to 0% win rate, it's kind of a tall mountain to climb. But I think overall, and letting the Hecarim Oakum like you wow, see, is definitely yeah. not one way to do it. They respond with potentially a Mordekaiser hovering the Soraka. I do really like a Soraka pick um, into this, into something like a Hecarim, but they have to go for the Mordekaiser instead. So put in both... Of the of both of the jugglers on the champions they care carried their individual games on. Absolutely a uh, very intriguing choice. This is gonna be an exciting game. Imaginary champ on the hack room was deadly, but I think um Q uh Q Q Q Lane on the Water Kaiser was arguably more deadly. So this will definitely be interesting. But the Soraka picked up. And in exchange, going into a Soraka lane, we have Renata Glask and Aphelios. So I have not seen a lot of Aphelios, um, especially outside of pro play. So definitely an intriguing pickup here for the side of Ascendant 5. Um, and we'll, we'll see. They have five seconds left. What USF White want to respond with? And it is Swain. Mm -hmm. So definitely a... A uh, very, very different drafts than what we have seen from the first two games. Um, what are you thinking is the, uh, from these first three picks on each side, like what is each team going for here? Um, Anti-Dive is the name of the game for Ascendant 5. Uh, they have a failure state, Renata. This is one of the most infamous Anti-Dive lanes. But, you know, for lack of a better term, they kind of blew their load a little bit too much in this draft phase. Uh, a little too early because they revealed an Anti-Dive bot lane, but only Immortakaiser and Soraka was really hovered. So while it discourages the dive picks, you can't really get a great counter pick like you were hoping for. Um, I think the Mordekaiser is a great idea because it worked so well last game. However, even though they did opt to go Mordekaiser in the jungle last time, that doesn't remove the idea that could potentially be a flux pick. Uh, I do like the Soraka overall. I think Soraka is a really good champion, very easy to execute. And the antithesis of easy to execute is a Aphelios. That champion is very hard to play. I've tried to play him 40 billion times to no avail. <laughs> Aphelios, um, guns. That's his champion. So <laughs> yep. he, has, he has guns. I uh, I like to classify his guns. Let me let me see. I have like names for them. So you have Rudy, which is the grab gun. You have a sh uh, Snipey, which is the it's the shooter. You have uh, Steely, which is the 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 scythe blades. Um, Bernie, and then what's the last one that I'm forgetting? Spinning. Oh wait. Is it? Oh, and Spinny. Yes. Those are the five. I feel, I feel like, the, right, Gibbs? I feel like you should name it to those. Because that would be easier to remember than Christian. Gravitum. Yeah. Gravitum. If we, if we go by uh, one of my favorite YouTubers, Scooch, his name for the guns mm -hmm. was uh, Snipey, Healy, AoE, uh, um, Rudy, I think, was the other one. And yeah, then Rudy. Sickle Mode. Those were his five. Sickle Mode. Those so, were his yeah. five versions of the gun. No, so. Definitely a variation, but there's Shana locked in. So here's the thing. Because of our proficiency in caster cursing, um, okay, I think their Shoshana pick is absolutely horrible. It is going to go 0-10. Okay, there, so I can watch oh, it. Oh, there we go. You've, you just confirmed that Tristana is going to, like, sweep this game. <laughs> sweep so, this uh... game. Yeah, I want to see it happen. I have just thought of it. I love Tristana, but the Aurelia locked in. A very interesting decision. Very um, interesting decision, as we don't see a lot of uh, AP damage on the side of Ascendant 5. You do have the Renata. You do have the Sejuani. But is that really enough to make an impact onto the enemy team? So definitely interesting is... It seems as though they are throwing the Aurelia in the mid lane. It's it's very weird. They're caught in general. I think the the first three were not too horrible from Ascendant 5, but I think their last two 
are pretty problematic, especially with an Olaf locked in to get through the CC. But to finish my thought here, Aurelia is self counterpicking to Helen back. Mordekaiser can death row, make it a 1v1, and Aurelia is very hard to win those. Swain, if you stay on top of Swain, he is never going to die because his ult doesn't last, uh, doesn't run out until you leave that area. Soraka, with the silence, makes so Aurelia can't really dash. Justana mm -hmm. has access to the. Uh, to the ulti and the rocket jump can get out of pretty much any situation where he puts it in. So she's going to have a very hard time diving onto this team comp, even with the help of something like a Hecarim and maybe a Sejuani. They can look to burst, but Aurelia definitely not having that 1v9 carry potential you like to see out of this champion. Absolutely. And there is still the possibility of the uh, uh, Swain perhaps going ADC and throwing the Tristana mid. There, there is that option because I, I remember that there was a combo of the Swain Soraka in the bot lane is just Swain will never die. But um, I think you are right. I believe it is the Tristana that is going into the bot lane with the Soraka. But paired up with a non-aggressive support, that is definitely an interesting selection for Tristana. Um, and, I mean, I have to assume Olaf going top lane and giving, uh, giving Mordekaiser back over to... Uh, Q, Q Chulane. He has the hardest name in this game. Like, dang it. <laughs> yeah, Q Chulane. I'll try to remember this best I can. But the top lane matchup is Olaf versus Sejuani. Level 6 Olaf probably wins that because he could just ulti through uh, Sejuani ult. He can run her down pretty effectively with something like the Ghost probably forcing out the flash and still being able to kill. But you're pointing out with the Soraka pick how it's not really great. Not not say you didn't say it. you said it was a bad pairing. It's just an unconventional pair. You usually like to see more aggressive. I mean, you you Tristana. were the one who said Tristana was a bad pick here. So I I said uh, I okay that was a fun <laughs> that was not meant to, okay. Mm. I don't want to I don't want to mess with the uh, the uh, the caster curse gods here right now. Yeah. Right now. Okay. So in order to thing. in order to counter the caster curses, both times we predicted the same team. So okay. I want to I want to get from you, who is your Go to to win this next game. Okay, I'm gonna say, <laughs> and that that includes like oh, our, our our pa our past uh, past games and this current draft. Who do you think okay. will come out on top? I think both comps are not great, and I'll go into <laughs> that. I'll go into that a little bit later. I'll go into that a little bit. But I if I had to take either one, it would probably not. I would say comp wise, I would give it to USF White. But I think a Senate Five are gonna pull it out. I think Game Two was a funny game. I think. There was just some problems with the mid game. They made some mistakes that snowballed into USF White being able to take over with a Mordekaiser. But the Soraka pick with Ashana is very interesting. But you do see Enchantress with Ashana being pretty effective. She does scale actually pretty well. But you just more so like the early game aggression. The one problem with playing Enchanter with a Tristana is that she has sort of a harder time playing in like sort of time like hitting and finding her identity the comp does she want to jump in jump out because with something like a jinx with something like a zeri you can immediately get back in the fight if you get the reset you can walk back walk forward if you're trying to convince the rocket jump she can't really walk up she doesn't have any more mobility or movement speed access to her so she really cannot be touched in these team fights or have insane peel so it's a lot harder to run compared to your traditional late game scaler but i think it's still something they can effectively run if they choose their fights right all right so in summary you think the draft on the side of uh, USF White is better, but you think A five will will uh, will take will take the game. Bro, saying better is like is like even a, it, it's, it's, it's the lesser of two evils. It's the lesser of two evils, dog. Okay, <laughs> it's not, it's but, not but, right but your end prediction is A five. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. Yes, my end prediction right. is A five because I will not let us go zero for six on mm -hmm. our predictions today. One of us is getting the prediction right. Uh -huh. I'm going to take. Uh, I'm going to take uh, USF White. I'm going to say they're going to come out with this game. If I'm wrong, oh, I have not in the first two weeks of games predicted a single game correctly. So that'll be really that'll good. be that that'll be a bit tough to swallow. But in the meantime, um, in in my personal opinion, I'm not a huge fan of um, of usf's draft just because i don't know what it wants to accomplish they have a bit of everything they have anti-dive with uh with swain mordekaiser olaf and then they have dive with tristana and it kind of doesn't doesn't seem to really mesh together um 
obviously going going for multiple different routes like a pig comp or a team fighting comp like all in one is always a good idea you never want to put all of your eggs in one basket like what happened in game one where it didn't really work out so um definitely a bit more options here for the side of uh usf but i i just i don't think it really meshes well together so i'm not a big fan of them but at the same time i'm not a big fan of a5 as well because i just i hate seen a lack of magic damage sure sejuani does magic damage yes renata does too but you have a swain and a mordekaiser and an olaf on the other team they're gonna have way more than enough like tanky stats in mr like just themselves to to withstand the damage coming from those two champions so they could just stack armor and if it'll feel like aphelios and aurelia and hecarim the actual damage dealers just won't be able to do as much so Definitely not a fan of either drafts. Like, I don't think they're bad. I think Hecarim, if he pops off, will still be able to take over the game. But Mordekaiser, as we've seen, will become an unkillable god king. So, like, definitely this is a curious uh, curious game free draft. It is spicy as all hell. I'm excited. Do you have any uh, closing comments before we go to a break? Um, I would probably like to say... That this is going to be an exciting series, no matter what the conclusion is, whether which team wins. But before, I just want to put a little poke into the U into the Zenith of Five draft. I think a Zenith of Five all around the board. Hecrum, Tristana with the Rocket Chump, Olaf with Ulti, a Swain W, you, Swain Ulti. It's hard for you to dive him, so they have a response for Hecrum. For Renata, they have the Olaf to dive her and make it so she can't really play the game. Tristana, they have easy access they don't they're not really an autofocus team too much at least range autofocus i mean tristana does some damage but it's not the the, the biggest end of the world uh aphelios i mean aphelios is kind of the one exception but like olaf kind of kills him aurelia like i said at the start she doesn't really have a good easy target to access on same with sejuani she can't really get too much done at least in my opinion so i think usf white has a response to every single member they send at five draft but i think a senate five kind of have I guess a mo more coherent comp. It feels like they're just team fight oriented, and that's it. Not that they are on the same page in the team fight, but that's all I wanted to say. Fair enough. One way or another, we will have the answer in about half an hour or so, or maybe longer. But <laughs> we are going to go to a quick break as we wait for the spectator delay to finish. Um, we will be right back with some more League of Legends actions as soon as we can. Game three coming up back to the risen recap today we're looking towards risen unstoppable and the stream started off with a Wake bang up. quicksand asleep it's, it's the first game of unstoppable risen pre-made come on get up come but on, come i gotta on. say he was Go. smooth once he rolled into it wow. and our first series was big bongo boys playing up against clarity black for the first yeah, 20 yeah, minutes of the game it was a bit of fighting in the top lane but not much happened besides that oh but the engage coming out from sejuani but it's traded back and malachi actually regenerated a lot more health than i would expect it there for Boxer Squirrel, just really those kind of impacts making a huge uh, difference in the gold. Yeah, and I don't know whether I want to call them Triple B, BBB, or Big Bongo Boys, because they're all, actually, they're not all same solo. Big, big Bongo then there was a mega turnaround fight for the big bongo boys after they made a big dragon attempt but then they got challenged again for the dragon attempt which big bongo big bongo boys won the fight to avoid on this side and there's a 3p on the other side but i can't clutch it and i can't clutch it but box of in the midst of all unable to get too much out but finds the q before he's last dies and chicken fried rice to his team with good depth does not unfortunately have the w enough up to heal him and they call comes back in the circuit but finds one can she find two no she gets shut down and the exchange of lives is so insane can maokai find the damage to treble back and he does but unfortunately it is the ace on the side of clb that allows them to get this dragon much later in the game big bongo boys chased akali down in the bot lane meaning that clarity black had so much freedom to take that first baron and from that baron they spiraled away from a team fight and took the victory the higher ranked uh, clarity black and uh honestly still performing Akali. extremely well oh and she can't get out simply tries to ulti over the wall but that's crucial. Four members sent down. This is the freest Baron I've seen. And it's incredibly hard to siege anything. As we're talking about that, the Dragon does in fact fall. This will be a very important fight. Dragon Soul on the line. Let's see. This is so easy. And the onslaught of shadows into all of the members. We talk about Wombo on one side. We talk about Wombo on the other side. But the whole time is not correctly pinned on enough members to make it worth it. And to make it so they can make this comeback. And unfortunately... 
Ladies and gentlemen, welcome, welcome, welcome. We got a series deciding game coming right up. Ascendant 5 against USF White on red side. I'm excited. We have no level 1 shenanigans like we had in game 1. We have Lucas going a bit crazy on the Tristana. But we also have a lot of respected chat with the good luck, have fun. Oh, I, I am excited for when we get the first action here. Spamming the emote, as you can see with the voice line. <laughs> Anil Gutters, what you see, Surge of Smoke and Victory. This just sounded looking to pop off in this game, potentially. Lucas played in the first game to pretty good success. He was 2-1-4 and four in the lane, but unfortunately not able to clean it up in terms of the mid game. We'll see how he plays now, but Prince... On the affairs. Okay, let me be honest here. You know, you're, I, my eyebrow is very, one of my eyebrows are very much so raised at this failures pick because he is a very difficult champion to execute no matter how good you are at the game, except if you're like, like Masters Challenger, maybe even like High Diamonds. But like, he has guns and he shoots the guns. He can, he's so simple, I know. Yeah, that's, that's like the simplest champion I've ever heard of. It's not like he has like his own HUD and 16 different abilities. Mm, yeah, there's just, yeah, it's not like that is just what is happening in these games, but <laughs> overall, A5's draft, a little more coherent. I talked about it in the draft phase, but I think the silent hero of the second game, at least for me, was Cheese. He had the prio like the entire game. So he was able to really allow his team to get a lot uh, like win these kind of top side and bot side fights because of his lane power and being able to rotate first to the first to them So now being on Swain versus Aurelia, he should continue to have push here and Further have that silent impact he had in game two. Oh, there's a level two From mint gets a decent trade-off, but she's able to proc that electric cue. trades a bit of damage back so all in on not the worst for cheese, but uh, Avoiding the level two all in from mint uh, impressive and interesting point about this mid lane matchup is the difference in summoners ignite versus ghost it's an interesting decision from uh, from at least i think cheese the ghost on swain allows you to kite people out better and also chase them down better swain's biggest weakness is getting out of that ulti range and if he can prevent people from getting out with something like a chase down with a ghost he can be really really scary in the team fights but that leaves him vulnerable to these fights Aurelia with the ignite is about 180 true damage of extra damage which swings fights completely in your favor oh uh, we have imaginary champ up here in the top lane duraluba does not have any flash he pops the ghost but will it be enough to get away the stun comes in from astral hailstorm and he is able to live a little bit longer but imaginary champ will be able to pick up the first blood on a hacker of well played there from both the top and jungler of Ascendant 5. Yeah, overall doing a really good job. It's it's Ascendant 5 who win in these short term fights, as we said, but we'll have to, uh, not the short term fights. It's Ascendant 5 who win in terms of these team fights in the early game. They are the better team fighters, but can they be the better objective controllers? The answer was no last game. I'm not sure if they're going to make it happen this game. The dragon spawning in one of the 17, but we got a top side fight. Oh, that that's not good for Imaginary Chef as the Gromp is picked up for Kuchu Lane and he's able to just freely pick up um, some extra health and has an item, or not item, I apologize, a level advantage over Imaginary Champ, just like last game. It looks like he's going to try and steal the blue as well. But Imaginary Champion's in enemy territory. Oh, not enemy territory. No, he's in his own territory. That's the funny part. Imaginary so Champ is trying to make a getaway, but he will not do it. But QG Lane is relatively low. The flash in from Mint is able to pop the shield as well. It looks like Astral Hailstorm will be going down, but Mint is able to at least trade one back for the side of Ascendant 5. So in the jungle fight, a two for one overall uh, lead there for uh, USF White. And sprawling. There's so many fights, just like in game one, reminiscent of that. And we gotta wonder where the next fight is gonna happen. Is it gonna happen on this dragon? These dragons have been taken around the seven minute mark, does it doesn't seem like it, but you can only Already we have uh, we have Kuchu Lane with double the CS of Imaginary Champ. So that is very rough for this hacker and we'll see if you'll be able to uh, make the uh, recovery here, but with a pushed up lane and bot lane, it looks like Imaginary Champ is going to look for something here. Yeah, they do have the control ward, so it is not spotted out by Lucas. And Prince does have to have a root gun, so if he can land it, he can crucially, but the fight is starting now. Alright, here comes Imaginary Champ. There is the root onto Lachacha. Lucas dives in. 
But the flash away for Prince keeps him alive. LaChacha is making his escape. He is being chased down by imaginary champ. Will he be able to get the kill? The heel flash keeps LaChacha alive. Lucas, does he have the W to make it no, over? It's on He's probably being like chased six down seconds. by imaginary champ. He's just running away. He'll have it back up. Being though. healed up by LaChacha is still does have to use the flash. Oh, oh damn! The flash code puts imaginary champ into a bad place, but he will be able to just walk out. Or will he? Here comes Kuchu Lane. Does get the drag. But it looks like with the Renata that Hecarim will be able to just walk away. Uh, meanwhile, in the top lane, Duralumen is fighting Astro Hailstorm. He does have a level advantage, but no minions on his side, meaning the trade will go actually in favor of Astro Hailstorm. Did pull up the Sejuani in the first game, and we were impressed despite that he had no items. So. Um, definitely putting forth a good effort here. And a, a non-stop continuous fight being passed around by the different members of Summoner's Rift. But what I really want to crucially point out here, but... As oh no, Astro Hailstorm has to make a getaway. Oh no, at that point you should just take the hit from the W, but unfortunately opts to try and dodge it and still escape with his life. Unfortunately he will not do so, and it is a kill going over to USF White. And yeah... Honestly, tanking it at that point is the right play. You're still dead either way, but there's a little bit more of a chance that the Swain just fully scuffs his E and doesn't hit it onto you. But walking back into it confirms your death. But what I want to point about that bot side fight is that Tristana has this unique ability to just jump on an AD carry. Really try to burst people, and she does have access to an X Factor like that. And, you know, I like the idea behind the play. Hey, the jungler's ganking. I want to trade one back. If he's going for my support and my support's running down my tower... I can dive on the enemy A to carry and potentially win the 1v2 or even trade a kill and then leave, right? However, mm -hmm. because of the summoner spell known as Exhaust, which is a really good <laughs> summoner, by the way, that you want to take as an A to carry, that calculation was thrown to the dirt. It was not able, he was not able to really find enough damage with the explosive. And so he couldn't get the reset on the W and was forced to use Flash uh, to try to escape the situation. But... Even though it was a scuff fight overall, stalling oh, out the here, time is really valuable. Here we go, in mid lane, Mint pulls out the all-in onto Cheese and just deletes him from Summoner's Rift. The CS difference in the mid lane is quite shocking if you look into a ranged versus a melee matchup as Mint is just smurfing on Cheese in this one. Yeah, Mint doing a really good job on this rally. This is definitely, you could tell, it's a character. This guy definitely plays a lot. Uh, maybe relying on it a little too much, but we see Duralumen in top lane time. here. Duralumen is now a uh, CC of view, but it looks like Astro Hailstorm is going to be able to make his escape. The stun there! Astro Hailstorm actually gets the solo kill in top lane, and Kuchu Lane cannot get a kill in the Death Realm. Everything is going wrong right now for the side of USFY. Will they be able to, be able to turn the fight, though? Kuchu Lane will die as Prince will pick up the kill that is now three kills in the span of just a few minutes going over to the side of Ascendant 5 and unfortunately Kuchu Lane is not alive to steal the dragon this time around. What an exciting game three we see a lot of action but Astro Hailstorm great ulti last second in the top side to secure his life and keep him in this top side you know trade CS whatever keep himself alive in this matchup the word I was looking for there. But in the bot side, the Mordekaiser was able to get out, of, uh, able to get on out of the Death Realm and uh, like get some damage in the Death Realm, and gets chased down by three members and wasn't able to run out. This man, Kuchu that Lane. is unfortunately the uh, downside of playing Mordekaiser jungle. Do you really rely on those stolen stats once you come out of the Death Realm in the team fight? So if you're not able to get that kill, all of a sudden you're just uh. Uh, mo uh, immobile uh, beefy boy in, in, in front of the entire enemy team. So afterward, he just doesn't have any extra stats to rely on, so it just gets deleted. So that is uh, unfortunate there for QG Lane. And despite the 20 CS lead in the mid lane, it was the response from Duralumen is to have a 20 CS lead over his lane opponent. This is one 33 CS at nine minutes. That is the anti Doin B 100 CS at at nine minutes right uh, right <laughs> or whatever and oh it's boy, kind of the, the anti join b the anti join b hack but oh swain potentially looking for an angle here wants to clear out the scuttle and we haven't talked too much about the scuttle crabs in terms of this uh really game uh mainly because stuff but like really scuttle crabs are the start of it all they are the 
you know, they're the fire that sets a fight, the fi uh, firework of the team fight. Uh, I guess is the best way you can describe it. They're kind of the reason to fight over everything in the early game. And so being able to obtain those early is very crucial in getting a lead in jungle. And it's essentially where Ch Ku Tulane's lead has become over imaginary champions. All right, so it looks like the Rift Herald will be picked up by Q Tulane. He doesn't steal it this time. He does take the entire objective for himself. So uh, that's a first for uh, Q Tulane, but... Um... Unfortunately, not much action in the past few minutes ever since that dragon fight. Uh, just uh, both teams just trying to trade back and forth. Uh, definitely some CS uh, uh, canyons uh, for both teams. Uh, for top lane, it's Duralubin. That is to be expected. Olaf will just bully out a Sejuani in the early game. That's not why you pick Sejuani. You pick her for the pick potential and the team fight aspect later on. That is fine. However, she's... Um, Still down 30 CS to Mint. Um, that is actually a bit unexpected, as you see the the melee matchup into range just shouldn't be like that. But Duralumen still has this wave frozen, and now he is fighting against Astro Hailstorm, but not much will come out of that. I like to pinpoint one point you said about the wave control from Doom Lumen. That is a really great way to obtain a nice CS lead for yourself, and especially freezing against someone who you know you can't, uh, who can't do you. Keeping the wave in this spot, even though it's not going to be frozen for too much longer, um, depending on how Astro Hailstorm wants to manipulate this wave. Still wanting to push it in. At that point, with the minions mm -hmm. even like that, you should just let it push back, and then the wave will eventually push to your own tower, and you can get a lot uh, of form. But he's trying absolutely. to push it in. Wave control as a top laner is the most important skill to learn. Part of the reason why I quit top lane is I sucked at it. So, mm -hmm. uh... Oh, there's the stun, but unfortunately, so definitely a good trade coming out here from Astro Hailstorm, actually. All of a sudden, the bully becomes the bull lead as he is pushed under tower. Yeah, and we talked about the lead in the top side, but leads are only good if you can go back to the base and spend it. They both have tier 2 boots. They both have around the same gold. Two ruby crystals, 800 plus a crit cloak, not crit cloak, plus a armor, uh, armor cloak is in total 1,000, 1,100 gold, about the same as the Hearthbound Axe. The items are bought, but before uh, the Kindle Gem was bought, it was only Hearthbound Axe, so they were actually pretty even on items despite the loot. Plus, now two extra plates picked up for Astro Hailstorm, so um, honestly, if you look at the gold value of both of them, they're dead even, actually, so this CS lead is almost null and void for Duralum and all that work for nothing. The dragon spawning in 45 seconds. The dragon fights crucial deciders in the last game on who's going to win. But this time, let's see if they are really going to be the difference maker in this game. All this right. Is Imaginary so champ might get caught out here as there is the hammer flash forward from Cheese to get the root. But unstoppable Imaginary champ will be able to make his escape. And now Q Tulane is fighting against Mint in the death realm. But Mint actually might be the stronger one here. Oh my goodness, you are trapped in a I am not trapped in a room with you. You're trapped in a room with me. Mint turns the death realm around and Q2 leg goes down. But it's going to be enough. The health bars are so low for both uh, Mint and Imaginary Champ, who are the two main members that can make stuff happen. So they're not actually, despite being able to kill the jungle, are actually able to do anything on the dragon. But a fight might occur in a little bit. Yeah, they, he may not have a lot of health now, but one of the great things about Aurelia is all you need is about maybe like one wave or so, and then you're back up to full. So definitely going to be farming that right now. The Rift Herald is summoned up in uh, the top lane, actually, but post 14 minutes, not going to get as much value from that Herald as uh, one would expect. So definitely a bit of a hit there for USF White, but um, still going to hopefully be able to get that charge up as Dura... Dura Lumen is in the top lane, uh, able to take out that wave. Wave control, wave control, wave control. Obtaining the prior on the bot side is what makes this play possible, but it does look like red team could potentially try to make an after f uh, fight afterwards, but that becomes quickly an afterthought as the dragon is finally taken, but the Rift Herald is spawned in the top side, and the fight now is occurring. Uh, yes, Dura Lumen throws the axe. Astro Hailstorm is slow, but it looks like there will be a charge as he's not going to be able to kill this in time. In fact, he's not going to be able to kill it at all as Dura Lumen grabs the solo kill in top lane and Mint trying to make an escape will he be able to. Yes, he barely walks out with his life. Imaginary Champ now 
three levels down, but is the health advantage enough to turn this fight around? Dura Lumen is an Olaf. He fights better when he's dying, and he will take out another solo kill for Dura Lumen in the top lane. Ah, uh, he shouldn't have, he shut me up in the first game. I talked about how he should not be the win con because his performance on the Rengar was a little subpar, but in this game, he's showing up big. A great, uh, you know, spread out 1v2, but still a 1v2 nevertheless. He was so low HP, and as you point out, Olaf crucially gets so much healing from being such low health, and his damage is just crazy. Um, even without the ulti, he has act- he had the- did he have the Trinity Force? I'm not sure if entirely if he had the Trinity Force. I uh, know, I believe he just bought that and TP back. His TP yeah. is down. Yeah, that's even more impressive. This Olaf- very much so a stat stick champion, but you do need to pick up and land the axe, so he played that very well here. And now you got to start questioning, do we want to play around this Tristana in, in this mid laner, or do we want to focus all of our resources up into our Olaf, who does have the ability to really dive something, uh, dive in Aphelios, dive the Renata, and really deal a lot of damage to the Aurelia. What is scary about a fed Olaf is you cannot stop a fed Olaf. The ultimate will come through, and... Whoever is in his way will go down, and there's nothing that you can do about it. So, definitely a scary prospect here for the side of Ascendant Five if they are if they let him get any further ahead. But there's the stopwatch from Cheese, and now Mint has to run away. But the root will get him. He is pulled back in, and Q2 Lane traps him in the Death Realm. And this is where Mordekaiser is his strongest. Mint tries to do something, but he will just go down and now it's the imaginary champ who is on the wrong side of this fight he will be able to run away but it looks like soraka is walking into the river never mind you they will just back off and let the hacker room escape bloody battle but everyone's bleeding all around the map <laughs> but it's uh, like an even bleed like overall yeah it's like an even bleed overall like all of them are like equally bloodletting it's kind of insane. <laughs> uh, so only a 500 gold lead from USF, but 500 gold leads don't really matter um, in these games. Yeah, and it was even up until that first uh, turret that had been taken. So uh, so relatively even. Uh, the ult used from Duralumen won't actually get anything, but here comes the rest of his boys to back him up. A good sidestep there from Astro Hailstorm will save his life as the roam up from Cheese and uh, Ch uh, Q Chulane actually won't do anything, but here comes a dive onto a load Zoraka. That's not where you want to be. Lachacha is rooted, stunned, uses the ult, but the Prince will take his prize. Mm, absolutely. They really well played that, uh, I think, over on the side of Blue Team, but it really crucially starts with the fact that Astro Hailstorm dodges out of that Swain E. As you talked about it on the play by play. Oh my goodness. <laughs> Oh, but Lucas just finishing off this Hecra, making it a one-for-one one in the situation, flies a little bit too close to the song and gets blown up by it. Yes, opting instead to focus on the turret instead of the champion. But here we go, we have another mid lane fight as Cheese pops the ultimate, but Mint just blast goes away, not willing to face uh, the enemy mid laner in his own jungle. Yeah, as you see, it's just... A really great game. Very even, as we pointed out, even more even from those previous plays. But I like the response play. Both teams really respecting the map in its entirety. When you see a play topside, you go bot side and make the, the response play. But crucially, also, Tristana was in base. She had the exhaust, she had the flash, she had the abilities to probably make a 2v3 dive not as favorable for Ascended 5. But... She's not there and she's recovering from base. She's walking back there. And so they see their opportunity and they strike on the Soraka. Absolutely. And now with this dragon spawning in 30 seconds, she's having to use the flash to escape the Wrath of Mint. So that yep. is definitely a crucial summoner on one of your main carries down for this dragon fight. Yeah, you don't have the flash on to the Swain. You don't have the flash on to Lachacha, who is really sort of the main carry. He keeps the carries alive. Uh, and that's really yes. what you need, especially into something like a Hecarim. Uh, the has Soraka the diff is real. That is correct. She does do a lot in these situations, but can she get them out of a sticky one as she's Imagine. getting go? Imaginary Champ dives in, does not use the ultimate quite yet, as Lachacha is going down, but not quite dead yet. Imaginary Champ is able to pick up that first kill, but Mint is trapped in the Death Realm. Will he be able to make an escape as he is fighting? He is chucking q late quite low, but he will fall, but q late will fall in return. Imaginary Champ 
It does get the Renata reset, but will he be able to get a kill out of it? No, he will not. The rest of USF White is making an escape. Both junglers are down, so this objective might not be taken just yet, and it's a two-for-two -two fight overall. It's a 3v3 fight that both teams look on to take. Duralumen in squad wants to go for this play. They're running them down. He does not have access to the ulti, but has access to a lot of damage. Yes, that is one of the one of the benefits of it, Olaf. He does have a heck of a lot of damage. So this third dragon actually looks like it is more in favor of USF White as they have the vision control on it right now. That one ward in the brush is not being picked up by the pink ward. So uh, a set of five, no, this is happening, but will they be able to do anything about it? Unfortunately, it's a 4v3 for now as the rest of their members are coming up, but it looks like this dragon will just be bursted down. So it will be the third dragon likely going over to the side of USF White as here comes QG Lane just to secure it and uh, the gold does remain almost dead even for both these teams. I think honestly if I'm on Ascendant 5, if you basically were keeping better track of cooldowns, you would notice Estrada just popped crucially to get a Felos out there. That was, that was a really smart play to ensure that Felos couldn't get a run down and a play not possible. But if you notice in terms of summoners, it is A5 with complete advantage, and when the gold is so even, I think, honestly, you want to take that fight, even if they've already taken the dragon, because if you can win that fight solidly, you are, have access to a Baron play to ex to make a gold lead possible for you. So, them having to go out of it is maybe a little bit of a sign of nerves, or just not knowing what the correct play is in that time. Yeah, especially on a screen, uh, on a screen uh, to this many people, you don't want to make those kind of mistakes, so... Mm -hmm. Perhaps a bit of caution on the side of Asc Ascended 5, but the Dragon does go over, so unfortunately no soul point for Ascended 5. They will have to wait at least four more minutes before they have another shot at it. Uh, Dura Lerman hiding in the bush right now. Oh no, Astro Hailstorm used his mobility. Will he be able to make this escape as Dura Lerman picks up the axe? Uh, here comes Dank Candle. Actually, the rest of the boys are here to try and protect their Sedge Wadi. Root coming in. Dura Lerman is now CC immune, trying to make his escape. But he has bitten off just a bit more than he could chew as Imaginary Champ will pick up that kill. Yep. The exhaust kind of sealing his fate there. Crucial summoner. That, like, you know, I would say that it's awesome they got to kill. But I think the exhaust is actually less worth. It is pretty not worth there at all. I would rather trade a kill and give him a kill than use the exhaust there. Because that exhaust is your main line of defense against a something like an Olaf. Because he is CC immune to everything else. But he's not immune to getting the damage reduction from the exhaust. Which is why you want that summoner so crucially. Absolutely. So we'll... They, actually, I don't think they'll have it for the next dragon fight, so we will have to see how they deal with the Olaf in that scenario. However, with the mid turret oh, yeah. down, there comes the perfect ultimate from Astro Hailstorm, and Mid will dive in and take what is his. However, now they have to run away as the root comes in. Mint forced to flash a good Renata ultimate, but Dirk Kacha, that is a weird interaction to see as uh, it looks like now Astro Hailstorm is in a world of trouble. So all in all, it is a one for one, but we will see if there's any more uh, action from this uh, chaotic little fight there. Uh -huh. A5 up to a silent 2,000 gold lead, but neither team can really do anything about the Sparrow. The variant is traded back as it always does with these objectives. We talk about dragon dances in this game. There's, the, of, of course, the vision dance, the back and forth. It's a waltz, a tango even. As one would describe it, you are in tandem with your partner, oh, and it Q looks like Lane, you might not be in the right spot here. Mint is dragged into the death row, but I actually favor Aurelia in this scenario, and he comes out on top. But unfortunately, the Renata will not keep her alive. She's flashing over the wall. Prince will flash after and take what is his. That is a two for one, including the jungler, and it looks like Ascended Five is actually going to start up this Baron. Yeah, it's interesting. Definitely not conventional for... Actually, wait, it's very conventional when the, dr when the jungler is down. I forget that Mordekaiser is their jungler. Mordekaiser I apologize. Mordekaiser is their jungler, not Olaf, but fortunately. Yep. <laughs> unfortunately, not how I am used to seeing it, but Prince, red and white, can take this objective super fast before the Mordekaiser even respond. It is not going to be the same case like the second game, where the Mordekaiser gets back alive before the objective spawns, and then he kills it with the smite. Unfortunately, we're not at that part of the game anymore, so... Lucas is able to pick up quite a few camps, actually. As you can see, his enti the entire bot side of Imaginary Champ is up. 
So, a little bit of trade back here, but definitely the Baron is worth but Prince. Oh no, don't take that Blast Cone. Okay, no. I didn't realize hey. Astro Hailstorm was there. I thought it was just the two on the enemy team, but Astro Hailstorm now finds himself in a world of trouble. Does get the ultimate onto Lucas, but will he be able to walk away with his life? Does have the bomb on his head, but that shouldn't be enough to kill him, as it looks like everyone will walk out unscathed. Unfortunately, he doesn't have Collector, so that... Maybe one more tick and a collector could have killed there, but definitely not with the Kraken PD build, which is so effective on this Tristana. You really get so much damage, burst, and consistent with the build that she goes for, so I really like the oh, idea. Oh, a bit of a misclick there from Cheese as he just accidentally hits his stopwatch, so that's a very critical cruel cooldown. Not going to be at this fight. As here come the boys, ready to start some trouble as this dragon is spawning in 10 seconds. Cheese misses the root. They do have vision on that brush, so they know that the Soraka and the Mordekaiser are, are there. It's just a matter of what are they going to do about it. Dan Candle is kind of uh, in a bad spot. The rest of his team is over the wall, so he is forced to flash. Uh, that is just a bit rough as he went in to clear the vision with none of his team there so to support him. And vision control is so crucial. It looks like Cheese and Ku... True lane might come from the backside, especially this Mordekaiser, but just kind of dancing here permanently. The dragon spawning. The dragon already spawned, and they want to look to take it. Both teams don't want to give an inch because they know the enemy team will take a mound. They got the root onto Astro Hailstorm, who will get chunked out, but it doesn't look like anything more will come of that fight. What looked like the start of the fight actually just turned out to be uh, more of an intro, but Astro Hailstorm but the is really chunked to half health. Here we go. Prince is brought in. Mint will dive into the enemy team. Prince is in the death realm with... Oh, wait, no. I'm sorry. Mint is in the death realm. He is chunked unbelievably low, but he will be able to make his escape. Imaginary Champ is the next one. Will he be able to make his escape? No. So this is resetting. Three for zero. Tristana dives in, and Lucas with a triple He's kill. He's gonna keep going. Will not be able to get anything more. He will just get the triple and die. But that is a five for one in favor of USF White. The Baron is gone. Dragon goes over to the red side. The OG resetting queen herself. Tristana rocket jumping, Goomba stopping all over the enemy team. Playing really well in the fight. Biding their time and then going Diego for the who? right play. <laughs> yeah, Viego who? 100%. But you know, the Swain in the early, you know... Did waste this opportunity to use the stopwatch, but they did not waste the opportunity to take the dragon of the objective. And they tie up the objectives here. And it is within 400 gold. I feel like it's been even for the past, I don't know, 15 <laughs> minutes straight. Which I think this is lovely. This has been a very even thought. game. Look. And it is, they are always the most entertaining to watch. A bloody close game. Those are my favorite. We'll see where it goes from here. It is now a bit more in the favor of uh, USF White as they are now back on the map and farming it again. So they have about about a 700 gold lead. But at this point of the game, that is virtually even. So definitely this is going to be a very interesting direction this game is going. And a perfect, perfect time for the Baron to spawn in about two minutes, 15 seconds. Going to spawn around that 30 minute mark. And that is really going to... Is, is going to be crucial in deciding who can potentially win this game because both teams have traded objectives so evenly. The Elder's not going to spawn for at least another 10 minutes, and I don't expect it to go that long. So this Baron and this main objective provides you with stats. It provides you with extra damage. Uh, I'm not exactly sure which stats because I'm a dumb 80 carry player who doesn't uh, research <laughs> stuff, but I know it makes you do more, it, okay? It does, it does make you get more. That is yeah, correct. Um... Also, I have to uh, bring attention to the fact that two Ocean Souls, or two, not two Ocean Souls, what am I saying? Two, two Ocean Drakes yeah. on the side of we know what uh, you mean. USF White. That is not good when you're playing into an Olaf. Already so much healing on that champ. Imaginary Champion, kind of going the wrong way, but is a speedy boy and will be able to make his escape. As he flashes the mastery, as he hit E and ran in the opposite direction. Oh, but a we have a bit angle. more of a fight here as Astro Hailstorm dives in. Lachacha is the target for uh, Imaginary Champ, and he is just absolutely destroyed by Prince. Uh, uh, Cheese is now trying to make his presence known with the ultimate. Dan Candle dies as well, and Astro Hailstorm dies off the screen. Lucas might fall, but he will not. Picks up the double kill to 5 for 2 in favor of USF White.
And they're looking to push into this mid lane. Probably the play they're going to go for is push in. Potentially grab this inhibitor because the death timers are so long. Or at least take a tower and then walk towards the Baron. Will they be able to end this game, them. actually? As Actually, I don't believe so. They, all, yeah, they don't have big enough minion now. wave and they are coming up in 20 seconds. I, I jumped the gun a bit there. No, you jumped the gun. You're just uh, you're too excited. I can't blame you for that one. I'm definitely excited for this game. But they're able to take an inhibitor. And we're going to probably see pinks come out on the Baron. They want this objective. And because of the way it's pushed in, it's going to be hard for a5 to immediately respond but they yeah they the pinks come out but why is just, oh well okay it looks like they want the game to be even longer than it needs to be yep and not often to go for that baron quite yet with the enemies responding in time not willing to take that 50 50 play they are sitting comfortably with a 3k gold lead right now and Wait, that might just grieving? might be enough for oh them to uh not opt-in for this fight quite yet. I'm griefing. The bear did spawn. Okay. My bad. Oh, wait. The bear did spawn, right? Am I... It just it just spawned, yes. It just spawned. Yes. I griefed the timer. I said it was in 30 minutes. Right. Anyways. Yeah. I'm, I'm definitely the, the best analyst you've ever seen in your life. No question. Guys, yes. don't, don't, I can don't definitely worry, understand you're objective. quite alright, my friend. <laughs> we, we, we got it. We got, we got it now, though. I'm all synced up with the correct Baron clock. It is spawned. And both teams looking to put pressure on it as they usually do. Yep, and with the dragon spawning in one minute as well, it will be uh, curious to see if there's like more of a more of a trade baron for dragon, or if one team is able to get a good team fight off and claim both. We will see how it plays out in the next minute or so, as both teams are now re re getting ready. I was gonna say rearing up, but that's not the right word. Getting ready for this uh, next fight coming up. Yep. Okay. It's a close game. Okay, let it me go through the list. Wait, it's a, it's, it's a close game. Uh, Castle Curse, Dragon's Even, Goldie. Actually, no, Gold's not even. It's a 300 for USF. And they have Thick Vision Control, and they're setting up a trap to potentially look for a play. Dark Candle pops the Shirellas a little bit too early. Maybe they want to look to catch up Duralumen here. Uh, perhaps when it looks like they are backing off instead as the rest of the team shows up and they have to re rescue the Prince. But now it's imaginary champ diving in for three of the enemy team and none of his teammates are there to help him. Astro Hailstorm is now caught in the Death Realm. Unfortunately, that does not look like a fight he will win, so he opts to run away. The Renata ultimate will catch quite a few of them, but it doesn't even matter. Imagine champ goes down, followed up by Mint. It is a bloodbath here on, for the favor of USF White. Astro Hailstorm is the next one to fall. Prince, no frontline in front of him, will not be able to turn this around as he is now rooted up and just taken out. Not even the power of Renata Glass can keep you alive. Jank Candle running away for his life, but it doesn't look like he will be able to save this game. USF White taking out the Nexus turrets. They will move on to the Nexus and will take this series. And it looks like you'll finally get a prediction right. Good on you, my friend. I did it. I got a prediction it. right. I did not go two weeks winless. I mean, I'm like one in four. That's still not, you know, a, that's wonderful. Still not a scene. great record, but I am on the board. That's what's important. Having a good time here. We got the victory screen on lock, and USF are able to take this series. I'm so happy and so glad for them that they're able to pull it. I'm sorry that my camera did not show up. Okay, so I, I apologize for the explanation. I have wireless headphones, and I they're USB wireless. And so I only have three available USB ports, one for my mic, one for my headset, and one for my camera. And so I had to use my camera <laughs> I used my camera to charge my headset because it's running out of battery. So I don't have my face cam anymore for at least the time being. Uh, however, that's because my face was blown off by how amazing these games were. Oh, oh yeah. Why didn't you just say that? That would have been yeah, yeah. so much more sense. <laughs> yeah, yeah, of course, yeah. But... Uh... Looks like uh, I am the only face that you guys will see for the next little while. I don't believe we have an interview set up for today. Um, but uh, looks like we also did receive some viewers from uh, uh, our second channel. So welcome to those who have just joined us. Um, apologies that you have missed this series, but it was a banger of a series, no doubt. 2-1 in favor of USF White taking out their opponents in Ascendant 5. 
Uh, we can't see my lovely partner here, uh, Slatty, for the time being, as his camera has gone down. Oh, it looks like he's back. I'm so. back, baby! Let's go! So perfect. So he, he's back. No <laughs> problem at all. Um, welcome, by the way. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, but, so, what are your impressions of this banger series that we have just had between these two teams? You put it simply, it's a banger. I went to three games. The last game was, like, on a razor's edge. And then USF fight, we were able to pull it out. And it was a reverse sweep in the set, actually. I thought a 7-5 played really solid game one and just messed up a little bit game two. But I think USF right really shut me up and told it said, Hey, you are wrong, my good sir. We are the better team here. And they proved it by winning this series. Really exciting action. And I hope to see more come out of both these teams in the future games that we spectate. Absolutely. So uh, we don't have an interview, unfortunately, for today. However... Uh, just for some closing uh, statements here, Slatty, if you had to pick one person to be your MVP, um, who would it be this time around? Uh, I it's Kuchulain, the Mordekaiser. Yeah, 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 I think I got it right. Yeah, it's the Mordekaiser. Right, yeah. yeah, he solo won game two. Uh, I don't. Uh, they solo won game two, and game three they played well. I I don't think there's too much to say or get in depth, but Mordekaiser was literally the only reason they're in the series. So their performance was immaculate. Game two. And they shut me the hell up. And I really appreciate that. Because now I know that Mordecai's a jungle can be pretty effective in certain situations. Absolutely. Um, in my opinion, I'm actually giving my MVP over to Cheese. I think he uh, performed as best as he could in all three games just overall. Um, absolutely. I believe the hero of game two was uh, Kukuleth. I definitely messed that up. But <laughs> <laughs> I believe it was Mordecai. Uh, for game two, um, just unfortunately, I just don't think, um, uh, I just think Cheese was a bit more consistent over the course of all three games. So overall, I'm giving my MVP over to Cheese. However, um, definitely was a bagger series overall. I was really excited to be here. Um, thank you for to all of you who joined us for this broadcast. Uh, any closing statements for you, Slatty, before we sign off for the night? Uh, no. No closing statements at all. It's just a banger series. I think it spoke for itself. Go follow me on Twitter.com <laughs> at SlideEV3, baby. Let's go. Get me up uh, to, I don't know, 70 view, 70 followers. That would be really appreciated. Okay. Anyways. All right. Well, then, all of you, you do have your assignments. Go over to Twitter. Throw a follow over to Slatty. Uh, let's get them up to 70 followers, eh, boys? But for all of us here at uh, uh, Risen Esports, thank you, everyone, for joining us. We had a blast of a time. I hope to see you all next week. Uh, be sure to tune in next time we are live. But for now, congratulations to USF White, and everyone have a good night.